do we do we start um krishnan will tell us uh, when uh, we are live are we live krishnan yeah people are already joining um yes we are live now on yeah. on so over to you manjula tanisha okay uh yeah so hi everyone uh welcome to our for second gad event and uh how it's it's wonderful to have uh you all and we will start uh and our first speaker for the day is humberto hernandez uh he is a colombo american accessibility activist and works a lot uh, when it comes to accessibility uh a fun fact about him is you know he had an opportunity to actually live in five different countries and he can speak three different languages oh that that's too much so yeah welcome humberto hernandez over to you and a warm welcome <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Alvaro Julie. And um, good morning. Good morning for those of you who are in the Americas. Good afternoon for those of you who are in Europe and Western Asia. And and good evening for all those of you who are in Eastern Asia and Oceania. Um, and happy, happy Global Accessibility Awareness Day for everyone. And and thank you, thank you for uh, taking the time to attend this presentation. Uh, and thank you for the quick in in intro. Um, my, as for those of you who don't know me, that's correct. My name is Humberto Hernandez, and as she mentioned, I am a Colombo American accessibility activist and assistive technology instructor. Um, I have worked for organizations, of course, in the private and public sector. You know, to break down you know barriers for individuals with all type of abilities, and um, I am a front end uh, web developer, certified, and you know, higher ed peer reviewer and universal design advocate for those of you who don't know me. Um, I've also dedicated a significant part of my professional uh, life, you know, testing, assessing, and remediating, you know, websites, educational courses, and also other authoring, um, author, you know, authoring tools, and um, to make, you know, to make them accessible for individuals with disabilities. Um, and as part of my professional endeavors, you know, I've also have created some nationwide programs like the BEVs or the Breaking Down Employment Barriers for Individuals with Disabilities. Um, and um, in, well, it's, it's, it's been more than 10 years actually working with, you know, this is for this population of individuals with disabilities. And just want to let you all know that, of course, currently I'm working as a, a instructional designer for a university here in the state of New York. And I volunteer as an accessibility consultant, accessibility trainer, and assistive technology instructor for different organizations here in Western Europe too. So those, those, those basically a quick intro about me and then let me start about my talk, talking about my research. So uh, this research uh, that I'm about to present was developed as part of a thesis project I had to create or build uh, to obtain my master's degree and is it is about a topic that I'm very passionate about and it is assistive technology, higher ed and students with disabilities and more specifically how does the awareness of assistive technology impact in the students with disabilities success at the college level. And I would like to start by talking about the person on the screen. Her name is Haven Germa, and Haven was born deaf blind, just like her older brother. When her grandma took her brother to East um, to a school in East Africa, they told her deaf blind children can go to school, but there was simply no chance for them to be part of educational experiences. Her family then decided to move to the United States, where Haven was born deaf blind. When it was time for Haven to join school. Her family was amazed by the opportunities afforded by the Americans with Disabilities Act. 30 years later, Hebe became the first deaf blind individual to ever graduate from Harvard Law School thanks to the supporting mechanisms built around ADA, law that I will be talking about later during this presentation. Um, the picture on the screen shows Haven using a piece of technology called Braille Note or Braille Display. Um, Deafblind individuals utilize it in their daily lives to have access to the world that hearing and sighted people have access to. Without it, Haven would not be able to read, communicate, and experience life as she would if she had this piece of assistive technology available. 
Therefore, she is a success case that shows that when university professors are aware of the assistive technology and program and curriculums are created more accessible, usable, perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust, the students with disabilities can succeed at the college level. And this is our brief agenda for today. I'll start with an introduction to assistive technology, then I'll move to the literature review, the methodology. I'll show some data facts as part of the research findings. I'll discuss those. After that, I'll talk about the limitations of this research and provide some recommendations. And finally, I'll close with the three EO perspective and the references. So let's start from the very, very beginning. You know, what is assistive technology? So Assistive technology is any piece of equipment that is used to increase, maintain, or improve the functional capabilities of an individual with a disability. Gancho and his colleagues grouped assistive technology into three categories, low-tech, mid-tech, and high-tech. So low-tech devices are non-electronic devices that require little or no training. For example, walking canes, magnifying glasses, high contrast notebooks or rulers. Mid-tech devices are those that are electronic and require minimal training and basic maintenance. For example, digital recorders, adapted or high contrast keyboards. And even for instance, if you have ever used the auto correction or auto fill feature on your phone, you have used a mid-tech assistive technology tool, perhaps without even knowing. High-tech devices include robust microelectronics that require training and ongoing maintenance. For example, screen readers, text-to-speech software, small braille keyboards, braille notes, etc. cetera. Um, so this wide range of assistive technology tools provide individuals with disabilities equal access to educational opportunities that non-disabled students have. And in fact, Alkani argues that assistive technology is the difference between experiences success or failure in educational settings for students with disabilities, and it can increase a student's participation in education activities. This, for example, is a quick list of the most commonly used assistive technology tools in higher education settings. JAWS or Job Access with Speech. JAWS, as we know, is a screen reader software that is perfect for students with ADHD, as it highlights word by word or sentence by sentence as it reads. This, for example, can help these students better concentrate. Um, this is, it is also natively used by individuals who are low vision or totally blind. Um, NVDA stands for non-visual desktop, desktop access and is also a screen reader. This one happens to be free and it is also open source. Um, we also have Fusion and Zoom Text, which are script magnifiers and readers software combined. So the literature review include, includes three main topics. The first one is higher education jurisdictional framework for students with disabilities. Why? Because we need to know what are those laws that protect students with disabilities in the US. The second, was, the second one is effective accommodations for students with disabilities, because we need to know what is that, that those laws guarantee for students with disabilities. And the third theme is universal design for learning and its implications in assistive technology, because we need to understand and know what is beyond effective accommodations. So we'll start with the first one, the jurisdictional framework around students with disabilities in the US. The first highlight we need to mention is what the US Department of Justice has made very clear, and is that people with disabilities have the same rights as any other individual without a disability. There are two laws that ensure equal access to opportunities for individuals with disabilities in the US. The Americans with Disabilities Act and Section 504 of the Vocational Rehabilitation Act of 1973. July 26, 2020 marked the 30th anniversary of the enactment of the Americans with Disabilities Act. You know, this landmark civil rights law protects access and opportunity for people with disabilities across community life, including education. This law is also used to eliminate discrimination and demand inclusion of disabled students in academic activities. Section 504 
works together with ADA to protect children and adults with disabilities from exclusion and unequal treatment in schools. In association with these jurisdictional regulations, there are three other pieces of federal legislation that influence higher education in the United States. It's the Section 508 of the Vocational Rehabilitation Act of 1973, the Telecommunications Act of 1966, and the Assistive Technology Act of 1998. Section 508 is a law created to eliminate barriers in information technology for people with disabilities. The US Access Board, which is the entity that enforces this law, reorganized the Section 508 standards to harmonize them with the World Wide Web Consortium, Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, or also known as WACAC 2.1 or now 2.2. The adoption of these web accessibility standards is perhaps one of the biggest advances made towards digital inclusion for people with disabilities in the US because it makes Section 508 the only, only US legislation that uses a globally recognized voluntary consensus standard for web content and information and communication technology according to the General Service Administration. The Telecommunications Act is enforced by the Federal Commission's you know, Communications Commission and requires all the educational telecourses to contain closed captioning for individuals who are hearing impaired. And this includes a streamed over the internet educational activities even. The, access, the, accessive, the, the Assistive Technology Act provides federal grant funding to generate awareness about assistive technology via demonstrations, technical assistance, trainings, and advocacy events. For example, each state here in the United States is mandated to provide support um, to customers, their families, and interested professionals to increase access to and awareness of assistive technology devices and services. Therefore, there are federally funded assistive technology trainings available for faculty, administrators, and staff in higher education settings via local centers of assistive technology that universities can start taking advantage of. Now that we have reviewed the legislative side, we can move on to the second theme, effective accommodations for students with disabilities. Unlike in high schools here in the US, students with disabilities need to register with the university's Office of Accessibility Resources and disclose they have a disability so they can request effective accommodations in higher education settings or in a higher education setting. Now, for an accommodation to be effective, three criteria need to be met according to the US Department of Education. The first one is timeliness of delivery. The second one is accuracy of the translation. And the third one is provision in a manner and medium appropriate to the significance of the message and abilities of the individual with a disability. So perhaps let's imagine the following a scenario that explains the importance of providing effective accommodation for or to students with disabilities. So let's imagine a student arrives to the accessibility office and requests a PDF to be made accessible via a screen reader. The accessibility office representative says, okay, yeah, I can have it done, but it may take until Friday. Well, the question is, is, is that an effective accommodation? Yeah, the answer is no. And no, because it is not timely on delivery. The delay, or, or this, basically this delay, will cause the student not to be able to participate and access the educational activity that his, her, their non-disabled classmates have access to right away. The same applies for accuracy of the translation. Let's say the accessibility office says, I can have it done for you today, but it will not include X, Y, and Z content of that document. Well, then that's, that accommodation is not effective because the accuracy of the translation has been compromised. And a similar case could happen with provision appropriate to the abilities of the individual with a disability. Let's imagine the accessibility office tells, tells the student, I can have it done today, it would include all the same content. However, I will give it to you in Braille, not digitally. Well, perhaps that doesn't feed the student's abilities either. 
Therefore, the educational experience of the student is being impacted by the lack of effective accommodations. So this may explain the reason why lawsuits have quadrupled against higher education institutions in the last decade, according to the National Council, Council on Disability. And basically all of this has a name and it is called Medical Model of Disability. And it is explained by the work of Burke Stollard. Her work says that professionals identify an individual's functional limitation and prescribe an adjustment that allows this person to fit into an established environment. Through this process, the accommodation model does not always provide an equitable experience for students with disabilities and can also lead to unnecessary dependence of, on a student's accessibility office. And this takes us to our third team, universal design in high grade, you know, high universal design for, for learning and its implications in assistive technology. And this, this theme starts by explaining the social model of disability. This model of disability suggests that what makes someone disabled is not their medical condition, but the attitudes and the structures of society. For example, what this model of disability says is that what makes a student request the PDF in an screen reader accessible form is not that the student is blind. It, it is that the course was not designed with accessibility in mind. So within that area of focus, a fundamental concept evolved. And this concept developed by Cheryl Bookstaller is known as universal design in higher education. And universal design in higher education is the design of educational products and environments to be usable by all people to the greatest extent possible without the need for adaptation or a specialized design. It is basically the proactive approach to create accessible content. What the application of this concept does is to reduce the need for individual accommodations and, op you know, and opens really the scope to solutions that one, yield universal design that are aware of the requirements of assistive technology, and two, assistive technology that are aware of the affordances of an universally designed programs. You know, assistive technology users are heavily dependent on affordances. And some of you may be thinking, um, well, what is an affordance? So an affordance in this universal design world is a perceived signal or clue that an object may be used to perform an action. And perhaps allow me to provide an example here so, so, so that you exactly know exactly what this would mean. So Im imagine you're blind and you enter a building. Um, you know someone is waiting for you on the 10th floor. You manage to find the elevator. You enter the elevator and notice the buttons are not braille. Um, you do not know what button to press to go to the 10th floor. I mean, you can always press all the buttons until you eventually get to the correct floor. However, that is not efficient and most likely is going to be a very unpleasant experience for you. The button in this case is the affordance or that perceived object that performs an action. The problem is that that button that performs an action is not braille. So the person with a disability has no clue what that button is going to do. So at the end, you know, this person will, you know, will be confused, disoriented and frustrated. Well, the same happens to students with disabilities in a digital environment when affordances are not taken into consideration during the course design process. It creates unnecessary burdens for students with disabilities because, you, because, and because of this, you know, students with disabilities will not be able to navigate the content. You know, their educational experiences will be negatively impacted and they will not be able to have access to the same educational opportunities that non-disabled students have, hindering so their ability to succeed at the college level. Once faculty members know about affordances, they can test, assess, and remediate course content for students with disabilities. You know, this universal design in higher education approach supports the social model of disability and the idea that 
design of educational products and environments need to be usable by all people to the greatest extent possible without the need for adaptation. Now, this does not mean that accommodation should not exist. You know, effective accommodation should be readily available when needed. However, they should not consume most of the accessibility department and our faculty efforts. So this takes us to the point that instructors need to be aware of common assistive technologies and how they can better integrate them in the design process. Now let's talk about the methodology of this research. The survey collected addressed specific learning processes current students with and without disabilities experience in the college level classroom. It was a survey collected by the NASI or also known as the National Survey of Student Engagement, which is the mechanism used to measure the level of a student participation at universities and colleges in Canada and the United States as it relates to learning and engagement. The survey was collected at a liberal arts college in the Northeast of the United States. A quantitative analysis was performed and the survey results and the literature review argued the need to understand the impact of assistive technology. The following research findings could be summarized by saying that students with disabilities responses showed significantly lower scores for questions that reflected high level of engagement, collaboration, and interactions. But from a critical analysis of data, the results of this research can be articulated to show evidence of left's social constructivist theory correlative relationships to universal designing higher education central ideas and assistive technology considerations to increase students' participation in educational activities. With regards to left's social constructivist theory, data consistently showed lower scoring responses for learning activities that included one-to-one -one peer review work uh, group discussions and real-time interactions compared with data from non-disabled students. Data was evident that students with disabilities lack teamwork in educational activities. And, you know, perhaps this is a point to reflect upon because the literature review delineated how effective and timely accommodations help students with disabilities engage and be part of the learning process, according to Walker. So this makes me wonder would this outcome or data would have been different if assistive technology had been used? That's something definitely to reflect upon. Well, the, the real, the crux of this research finding is that barriers of inclusion for students with disabilities still exist. With regards to universal design in higher education concepts, you know, findings that emerged from the NASA survey related to information about engagement indicators and, indicate, and, and interactions between the students and instructor. Two themes emerged out of that, learning traceability and experiences with faculty. Responses of often and very often were recorded for learning traceability, perspective taking and internalization across the board. So students with and without disabilities do connect those teachings with personal and societal problems. On the other side, 100% of the students, 100% of the students with disabilities replied never or almost never about whether they worked with a faculty member on activities other than coursework, while 30% of the non-disabled students participated often or very often. And, you know, in this type of extracurricular activities, of course. So similarly, students with disabilities discuss course topics at lower rates compared to students who were not disabled. With regards to the research findings about assistive technology, we can say that the literature review research supports that, supports the fact that assistive technology provides independence means for students with disabilities to overcome curriculum barriers and increase quality of learning experiences. 
However, the Nazi survey did not include nor discuss information regarding assistive technology. We discussed that assistive technology tools provide individuals with disabilities equal access to educational opportunities as non-disabled students have. Nevertheless, professors lack awareness or lack knowledge and experience with this type of technology, according to Pitchin. And that's the problem. That is the problem because there is a profound relationship between assistive technology and class engagement for students with disabilities. And in the application, nothing happens. Nothing happens. So to this end, the civil rights of individuals with disabilities are violated under US law by intentionally or unintentionally creating barriers that hinder their professional, personal, and ultimately human development. So it is the professors, the colleges, and the university's responsibility to design perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust educational experiences that are accessible for some and usable for all. This takes us to the discussion points, which are that assistive technology is used to create a more egalitarian system in human development. However, faculty members do not know about it or how to incorporate it into their, class, into their classes. Therefore, students with disabilities experience lower levels of class engagement and never work with faculty members on extracurricular activities. And that's why they need to be, you know, these courses need to be accessible. They need to be universal design in higher education accessible. And they need to, you know, they, they need to have and consider, you know, faculty need to consider these affordances so their impact can actually be measured. There were, of course, limitations of this research because only one institution was canvassed. And the assistive technology profound impact in learning goals was not measured. Hence, a deeper investigation of the educational activities and practices may be presented, uh, you know, may have presented a broader understanding of the assistive technology impact. Those are some of the preliminary thoughts that take me here to the recommendation slides, where I acknowledge that more research is needed to con contribute to a more thorough understanding of the impact of assistive technology and its awareness by professors in the process of human development and learning. That's why I also hope this body of work can be used for the benefit of students with disabilities. Another recommendation is that training in assistive technology and its affordances is conducted at universities. Centers of assistive technology that receive federal funding here in the US are mandated to generate public awareness about assistive technology via assistive technology demonstrations, training, technical assistance, and advocacy events as part of the Assistive Technology Act. So colleges can take advantage of those. Additionally, another recommendation is that assistive technology-based questions are added to this national survey of student engagement NACI assessments to actually assess the role and impact of assistive technology in the success of students with disabilities. And the last recommendation is that higher education diversity efforts include individuals with disabilities. A lot of the times we hear universities here in the US wanting to increase diversity and enrollment of underserved populations. And we only hear about black, browns, Asians, but we do not hear anything about students with disabilities or individuals with disabilities. And actually the largest minority group in the United States is people with disabilities with more than 56 million people, according to the US Census Bureau. So I do believe that it is time to tap into that market of students who are eager to study and work, but do not find accessible or flexible universities that are willing to work with them. And this takes me to my 3EO or my three eyes open perspective. And 3EO is a practice in which you focus your leadership attention and efforts on three things, 
your actions, your immediate circle, and the system. And my 3 year perspective start with me being more aware of these individuals' needs and the technology available to make their lives easier. And from a department perspective, I see myself utilizing this knowledge to design accessible content from scratch. And from a system level, I recognize that there are changes to be made and awareness to be spread. And hopefully, this body of work serves that purpose. And, and to finalize this presentation, I would like to read this quote by Haven Gurma. I was inspired to go to law school. And in 2010, I entered Harvard Law School. Harvard told me, we've never had a deaf blind student before. And I told Harvard, I've never been to Harvard Law School before. We didn't have all the answers, but we pioneered a way using assistive technology and high expectations. It is okay not to have the answer as long as you try. Try one solution. If that doesn't work, try another solution. And we kept doing that. And in 2013, I graduated. I hope this presentation and this quote had inspired you to learn a little bit more about assistive technology and individuals with disabilities. I hope you spread awareness of assistive technology from your respective roles in society. And finally, I hope you find ways to incorporate assistive technology and individual with disabilities empowerment efforts from your different capacities. And, and remember what Haven said, it, it is okay not to have all the answers as long as you try. Try one solution. Thank you. Here are the references. And we'll definitely move to the Q&A. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. That was really an informative talk. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you, you can so go ahead with the questions. Uh, yeah, so uh, this, this question is uh, very uh, close to me because I, I am starting to learn about accessibility. So uh, what would you tell to someone who is new to web accessibility and wants to start learning? And since in our universities, it's not a particular subject. So how would you suggest to go about with this? I think the, the first thing I would say to this person is find a friend or an ally that is disabled so that you can learn from them because um, that's exactly what I did. And I think it was the best way because a lot of the times people think, you know, I'm going to start this accessibility journey and they start taking all these courses and learning about all these things. But if they don't have someone who can really relate and can really, really be there and say, this is how I experienced this. This is not what the theory says, but this is how I, from my eyes, I'm seeing this or, or from, from my perspective, I'm seeing this. Um, if that does says that is not included there in the accessibility course, you are not doing something right. So I think, you know, the first thing I would say is, you know, find an ally, find someone that, you know, can mentor you, can, can assist you that must hopefully, you know, or that perhaps um, have different type of abilities than the ones that you have. And from there, you know, learn from them because those, those natively, you know, those native assistive technology users have really all their perspectives and experiences for being users for life. And they can really teach you a lot more than just a course online. Yeah, that's really informative. It's very good to have a person that you can go back to so that you keep learning tomorrow. And uh, I, I would be very interested to know, like, how did you get into web accessibility and how was your journey, if you could share? Oh, absolutely. So I'll, I'll start from the very beginning. Um, so back in when, uh, when I was doing my undergrad, I, I, had a, I had actually a classmate who was low vision, very low vision. Um, and, and he used an, a screen reader to actually go over all of his class materials. And I remember, you know, it's gonna sound very rough, rough but I remember the, the university where I was studying, they, unfortunately, the professor never provided, you know, PDFs or PowerPoints or Word files that were accessible for him or even websites that were accessible for him. And, you know, he really, really, I really saw him struggling. Um, and perhaps that was the first time that I started kind of like reflecting upon, 
accessibility and noticing that, wow, there is a lot of things that need to be done for him to be able to uh, experience education as I am experiencing, am I experiencing it? So that was my first glimpse to it. Um, you know, kind of like seeing, unfortunately, from his end, his struggles. And because of seeing his struggles, you know, I started to dive in a little bit more into accessibility. Then I moved to this company where I was working as a corporate trainer. And we launched, you know, a, um, a hiring initiative that included hiring individuals with disabilities. And we had actually a high influx of individuals who were screen readers who applied to these jobs. And we were like, ooh. I don't even know if our authoring tools like Salesforce and C, you know, um, Sugar CRM and all of these customer management systems are accessible. <laughs> so we, we, you know, I had, you know, some, uh, I, by then I had some um, exposure to this accessibility world and this assistive technology world. So we launched these initiatives to ensure that we were uh, making, you know, our processes inclusive and accessible and usable. So we were, you know, we had to work with them to ensure that all of these websites and authoring tools were accessible. And, you know, I can go on and on with all the journey, but basically that's how I started. And, you know, it's shaped in many ways, you know, by working with, you know, as I said, you know, with uh, websites and course, um, educational courses, training curriculums, and all of these things that we had to make accessible to ensure these individuals were able to experience the same educational and professional and personal and human you know, opportunities as any other person without a disability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. It's, it's great to hear that empathy drove you to like uh, working towards it. One last question. Uh, uh, do you mind sharing any resources that, uh, especially for students, so that they can head start their uh, accessibility journeys, something that they can look out for? Um. I'm sorry, you said a like a resource they could start looking into? Yeah, yeah. anything. Like they could just not delay it and head start it and go on with their journey. Yeah, um, and not to do marketing for anyone here, but definitely I will tell you what I found myself, you know, personally, you know, useful out there. Um, definitely, you know, DQ, you know, trainings are fantastic, you know, or Duque University is fantastic for all of the accessibility training. Um, and um, edX, you know, specifically the World Wide Web Consortium uh, edX course in um, coding and also accessibility is extremely informative. And I will say, I will say that if you just kind of want to start, you know, dipping your toes into this huge sea of <laughs> or ocean of accessibility, I think those two courses would really, um, or those two points of reference would really give you, you know, a holistic sense of of this arena or this area or field and and that would be a good start from all of you mm -hmm. great great i think there is one question on youtube by krishna uh, he says what to consider for neurodiversity user when we are building accessibility products you know i would tell you you know if you are not utilizing individuals with disability during your testing process, you know, when, when you are testing, assessing and remediating, you are not utilizing individuals with disabilities in anything that you are trying to make accessible, whether it is a website, a course, a authoring tool, a CRM, anything, if you are not actually utilizing that authentic review by individuals with that are natively or, or native, you know, assistive technology users, there is something that you need to reconsider. And I think that's something I've said, you know, for forever. Um, and I think that's something that I would definitely, definitely say is that perhaps one of the, mo the most important thing that, you know, needs to be taken into consideration as you perform all those reviews. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so much. It was a wonderful to have you here. Absolutely. No, thank you so much for the invite. Thank you to all of you. Happy, you know, Global um, Accessibility Awareness Day to everyone. And thank you for the invitation. It was great to, 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 to participate in this event. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye. Okay, so that that was that was really nice. Uh, the next topic for uh, the day is, you know, how would you create accessible JavaScript widgets using HTML. And we have uh, Joshua 
who is a full stack senior full stack developer and uh, he has been working he has also worked with access for all and uh, that's like a swiss foundation for the use of technology for the disabled and uh, he he's been working with web accessibility a lot actually a fun thing about him that i would like to share is he loves kickboxing and he he is also a lindy dancer so yeah welcome uh, welcome joshua the stage is over to you all right should should i just start already it's like 5 minutes uh, early yeah i i i think we can start sure okay cool that gives me a little bit more space um that's nice so yeah i'm just going to share my screen let me do this share the sound okay yes let's hope this works do you see my slides yep perfect so welcome everybody to uh, my talk about the topic complex and accessible JavaScript widgets with simple HTML. So let me just start my timer here so that I don't miss the time. Okay. I'm holding this talk, yeah, um, in the scope of the Global Accessibility Awareness Day and my special thanks go out to the team of Hello Accessibility. So thanks for organizing this event and thanks for having me here. So a big hello from my side to everybody. My name is Joshua or Joshua or Joshua. All three forms are, are, uh, are acceptable to me. Um, I'm a full stack web developer for roughly 15 years now. And I can say that I have a, a kind of a deep affection for humanity. I see so much potential in, in every human being. And they have the profound belief that technology should always be, be used to unlock this human potential. And this means that we have to include as many individuals as possible on this, um, on this path. So as there was already said, I've been um, an access accessibility expert working for my former employee, Access for All for like eight years. They are doing accessibility business for over 20 years now. So they are like the very early ones, um, yeah, investing energy and efforts in this topic, like two, in the year 2000 already. And I'm the initiator of the Accessibility Developer Guide, which is a comprehensive resource about all topics accessibility, which we will see today a little bit more. It's tangible, it's technical, and still it's easy to understand. And it offers a lot of code examples, which you can kind of uh, take as inspiration or maybe even copy and paste into, into your own project. The whole guide, including the code, is written by developers and for developers, but not only developers, also like designers, content creators, or other stakeholders, but it's mainly a developer's resource. It is open source, so when you head over to accessibilitydeveloper.guide.com, uh, we are happy to welcome you in our small but like enthusiastic little group of Swiss and international agencies, web agencies, um, developing this guide together. So I started to work for a new employer this year, which, which, whose name is actually nothing. It's just kind of funny. It is a peer-to-peer -peer organized life web agency and venture lab located in Bern, close, close to Bern in Switzerland. And our mission is to help designing a future where technology is used as a tool for humanity and not as a weapon. And our current goal is to become the kind of leading accessible first web company in Switzerland. So if you have any interest in us or our services or our products, just head over to nothing.ch. 
Our current flagship product is PeerDOM, which helps us and our clients to transform to peer-to-peer -peer organizations. So if you have any interest in this, we can help and support you to do the, the transformation in your own organization. Let's start with a simple question of trust. I mean, a climber heavily trusts in the reliability of his rope and carabiner linking you safely to the rock face, right? And in a highly complex and interconnected world, we need structures and values on which to build, on which we can rely. And the web design is becoming more and more powerful. And often there are many ways to reach a goal. So regarding this link, what do you trust more? A link implemented using an anchor tag, using an href attribute, or a link implemented using a span tag and an onclick attribute. I guess all of you um, <laughs> are, are agree with me that it will be the anchor tag to trust in, right? But why? Let me tell you a few benefits of using such traditional HTML. First of all, you get a lot of behavior for free. If you just use this anchor tag, the browser will take care of like everything that can be done with this link, which is clicking on it, taking you to the address, providing keyboard focusability or other means of interaction. It offers styles for free, like the usual underline that we see. And it even offers different states that you also can like target and, and style yourself, like focus, hover, active states, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Traditional HTML has a huge compatibility with like old and new user agents. So we can trust that this traditional anchor tag will be working in a browser 20 years ago and probably also in a browser 20 years from now. Needless to say, it doesn't need any JavaScript and as such degrades gracefully, even on limited or older machines. You will say now, um, and now let me, let me say a few words about this word traditional, right? So technically spoken, a span, and is also 100% valid HTML. But when I call something traditional, I mean taking an element which has a traditional purpose for which it was designed and which you can use for exactly this purpose, right? Instead of creating your own custom solution. So you will say now, hey, but wait a moment, we can enhance this span. We can make it look and feel and act like a real link, right? So for sure, we can apply custom aesthetics using CSS here, or we can add some custom behavior using JavaScript. We can even make it focusable with the keyboard by using the tab index. What few people, probably know is that we can even change semantics. We can use the role attribute, which will change the semantic of an element. So the current span will now be announced by a screen reader as a link indeed. Still, the question is, how will it perform in the real world situation? And I created a little, a little code pen here. Oops, let me make the browser. Uh, not full screen anymore. Let's see how these two solutions or even three solutions, the traditional link, the, the bare span and the optimized span, how they will perform. So I can click on the link and obviously it takes me to the target. I can also click on the span. And that's all right, it works too. What about keyboard operability? I can tap to the link. I can activate it using enter, that's nice. I cannot focus the span, the, the bare one. I can indeed focus the, the optimized one, but when pressing enter, nothing happens, right? There's more things. Um, I can try to bookmark the element by drag and dropping the traditional link to the bookmark um, bar. 
I cannot do the same with any of the spans, not even the focusable one. It's still not drag and droppable. I also have a context sensitive menu for the traditional link, which allows me to open the link in a new tab. This is not available for neither the bare nor the optimized span, right? So as we see, even though we do our best to mimic the style and behavior of a real link, the spans still are not really links. As we have seen, we, we cannot open any context menu. Um, we can't bookmark the element. We can't even activate it currently using the keyboard. We would use more like JavaScript for that. Um, and possibly there are many other things um, that we may not be even aware of that they exist that we would have to take into account and in creating such a custom solution. So our interim conclusion is traditional HTML beats quirky custom solutions. Nearly all the time, in my opinion, this is fact. Because as we have seen, there is much functionality that we just get for free, which just works in all kinds of input and output devices. As such, we can say it's very robust and it is performant. We don't have any like JavaScript overhead. You may say now, but, but why? Why would anybody implement a link using a spam tag, right? So I came, there, there are three reasons that come to my mind. First of, of those reasons is just pure ignorance or unaware being unaware of the, of the situation. And trust me, during the last eight years that I've been working as an accessibility consultant, I've encountered innumerable times that even seasoned web experts were implementing things on their websites with, with just the wrong HTML elements. Just to name a few typical bad use cases here, for example, list of search results, and also uh, navigation menus in, in single page applications. And just to see uh, a current problematic uh, example that I've just stumbled upon a few days ago, it's, it's Apple's product list. So if you open the Apple product list, you see the hand, the, the, my, my pointer, I can click on these elements, but in fact, they are not links. We don't have a, a, a context specific menu here. If we inspect the element, we can see, in fact, it's just a picture with a lot of diffs around it, but, but no real link to, to find here. So as you see, even like the experts <laughs> are doing this kind of stuff. So it's really, it's really a problem. So, so my advice, or I even beg all, all um, out there, everybody of you, please stop doing this. It's wrong, it's ugly, and it just uh, opens a can of worms of, of worms of problems, right? So please just use real links or buttons, depending on your context. Reason number two, some HTML elements cannot be styled as wished. This was true, especially in earlier days where many HTML elements just offered limited CSS. And still today, some of the elements cannot be styled in most browsers. For example, the select tag. So if you have the situation where you need a stylable kind of select dropdown, you can use those role attributes. You can just use like a, a generic diff structure and apply a role of list box to the element resembling the select element. And you can apply many role equals option for, for all those uh, elements resembling the, the option elements. The third reason that is that in fact, sometimes HTML is just missing the, the, the functionality, the feature, the element that you want to implement. So quite a few well-established usage patterns um, don't have an HTML equivalent up to this day. For example, there is no tab list tag, nothing like that. So if you are in this situation, you really need to kind of tinker your own custom solution. And just to give an example, you can, for example, 
And you can use an unordered list and apply a role of tab list to it. And for all the tab elements, you can apply role equals tab. So we've seen this role attribute uh, quite a few times now already. Where does it come from, actually? It comes from the AREA, the Accessible Rich Internet Applications Standard, which was released already eight years ago by the World Wide Web Consortium. It offers attributes to enrich traditional HTML with semantics. And that's the important point. It only adds or changes semantics, nothing else. It does not provide any inherent functionality by itself. So for example, to come back to my diff, my, my role equals list box diffs, they will indeed be announced by screen readers now as a, a, a select element, but you still cannot interact it, neither with, um, with screen readers, nor with, with mouse or keyboard or anything like that. This means you need to add all this functionality yourself using JavaScript. For example, you need to manage all the visibility and styles of the elements. You have to provide keyboard focusability and the general interactivity of your usage pattern. And what is not obvious at first sight, you also need to update the semantics in the background. For example, if you choose an option here, you need to to, to apply the area selected equals true attribute to the selected option. So this becomes quickly pretty complex and I will demonstrate how complex it is with an, an, um, a, the example, an official example from the World Wide Web Consortium, the collapsible drop-down list box example. So let's open it in a new tab and open it in code pen so we can play around with it a little bit. And let's just have a general impression first. So I can click on it, I can open and close it, I can select an option. It looks and feels quite like a select tag, right? Let's see whether I can use it with the keyboard so I can focus it, right? Yeah. I can choose an element, I can press enter to close it. That's all fine. Let's have a quick look at the HTML that was used. So we have a button here and we have an unordered list with role equals list box. And we have a, quite a few list elements with role option. This looks fine so far. Let's look at the CSS. It is 150 lines of CSS, which is quite, of, quite a lot already, I feel, uh, just to kind of mimic a basic select tag. But it allows us to do what we initially wanted to do. We can style the element um, as, as preferred. We can, for example, apply a red color to the items. And now we see beautiful. Now we have red elements. This would not be possible with a, a native select element. Cool. Let's have a quick look at the, the DOM, the document object model, when we are interacting with the element. So let's open it here so you can see it. Let's just interact a little bit with the keyboard. Come on, right, open it and browse through the elements. And as you can see, there's quite a lot of things going on. We have CSS classes that are toggled. We have different area element, uh, attributes which are toggled, which are moved around. Even the button's text is changing manually to the currently selected element right here. So quite a lot of things are going on here. And not surprisingly, or maybe surprisingly, we need a lot of JavaScript for this. It's 900 lines of code, actually, that we need to make this element mimic uh, a native select element. And if we think back um, about the, the anchor tag, which also had kind of a lot of hidden features that we were not, not, not aware of, it's probably the same with a native select 
uh, with yeah with the native select tag that we need if we, to really make it working for everybody we need to provide a lot of functionality here all right so as you see we need over 1000 lines of code to make this basic not native but a native mimicking um, select drop down possible and the problem here is the support for area still varies drastically among different browser and screen reader combinations. So the worst case scenario could be that you invest hours, if not days or weeks, into creating your perfectly standards compliant area implementation, but still some of your users might not be able to use it because they use a browser or screen reader combination, which, which is not yet 100% um, supported. Also keep in, keep in mind that ARIA does not have an answer for everything. So ARIA's bouquet kind of is, is limited. While, we, while it offers uh, a standard for, for like the list box or the tab list, there is no date picker, for example, and other usage patterns are also missing. So you will quickly reach the point where there is no official recipe for what you want to achieve. And what will you do then, right? So this is, it's obvious that you can't rely exclusively on area, that there must be some other ways of offering accessible interactive usage patterns. And this is the perfect moment to introduce you to the first rule of area use. It's also taken from the World Wide Web Consortium and it states, quote, if you can use a native HTML element or attribute with the semantics and behavior you require, then do so. Do not instead repurpose an element and add an area role, state or property to make it accessible, end quote. So easily spoken, if there is a native HTML element which does what you're trying to achieve, then please just use this element. And as you will see in a minute, there nearly always exists such a native element, even when not obvious at first sight. But before digging into this, let's first take a look at existing implementations of custom drop-down list boxes, starting with one that we probably all know, Google. So let's open Google in a new tab, enter something into the prompt, and we see the suggestions below. Now we're gonna inspect those. And we can see Google does, does as expected, it's just a, a, an unordered list with the role of list box. And below for each option, we have this diff with the role of option, right? So nothing too surprising here. So, but I have to say, although Google uses those role attributes, screen reader accessibility actually is rather mediocre. I've tested it in advance, and while it announces itself as a searchable combo box, which is good, it does not announce any availability of options. So we don't really know as a user, are there any options now? How, how many are they? How do I interact with them? But if for at random, or just if, you, if you're an experienced user, you're using your up and down keys, the selected option will be announced to you. The second autocomplete that I want to take a short look at is Amazon. So to make it short here, Amazon does not use any area. They only use diff and spans, so just a very custom generic implementation, which means that also screen reader accessibility is rather bad, if not existent. So it does not announce itself as something like a, a drop down or a, a select box or whatever. It just announces itself as a bare text search. Uh, a new user would never know that this offers some suggestions to them. It also does not announce, obviously, that there are options, right? 
at least if at random or by accident you are using your up and down keys, it will announce the selected option, which is rather um, a coincidence in my opinion. So in turn conclusion here, both Amazon and Google, they need a custom dropdown. They wanna style it in an appealing way. So something like a select is not an option, right? Both Google, no, not both, but Google uses area. Amazon does not use area. Both of them probably have lots of JavaScript in the background handling this element. And still accessibility is mediocre to even bad, right? And this is kind of a, this is not very satisfying, right? So my question, couldn't this be done any better somehow? And I want to remind you now on the, the first rule of area usage. Isn't there some traditional HTML element available that we can use for this? And in fact, there is. They are called radio buttons. If you know how to do it, radio buttons are 100% customizable. Namely, you can style your label elements as you prefer, and you can visually hide the input elements, keeping them still focusable and interactive for any user, inter, uh, user agents, right? So obviously no JavaScript is needed here. And as it's a native element, it's 100% accessible on any platform. Let's have a look at an example for this. And now we are coming back to the accessibility developer guide. Let's look at a list box of radio buttons. In our guide, we call it the, the ADG auto suggest, ADG for accessibility developer guide. And we will take a look at it in a moment, but let me state first, it is using radio buttons as promised, and it offers very good screen reader accessibility. It announces itself appropriately. It announces the availability of options. It announces the currently selected option and the total of options. And rest assured, only a tiny bit of JavaScript is, is, is needed for that. So the current talk is, is kind of a small version of, of a full day or half day workshop that I used to, to, to have, to hold where I show in four milestones how to implement exactly such a widget. And the milestones are number one, basic HTML, just implementing the basic HTML structure. Then number two, adding interactivity using JavaScript. Then adding some basic accessibility optimizations, just a few lines of code and apply visual styles in the end. So, that, so it looks fancy or the way we want it. And now let's just look on the, the, the fourth, the final version um, of the widget. I'm opening in a new tab. And as you can see, it doesn't look very fancy, but you get the point. We can open and close it. We can browse with the mouse through the option. We can even enter some text Oops. and it will filter the element. We can for sure use it with, with the keyboard only. Right. And now let me change the view here to debug mode. So we only see the element and not all the, the GUI around. So if we disable CSS now, you can see that it's actually really only a list of radio buttons. And by using the up and down arrow key, we are toggling through the element. Very, very easy. Let's see what a screen reader does with that. So I'm opening my Windows 10 virtual machine here. I have Firefox started and NVDA. All right, let's activate speech mode. Speech mode beeps. Speech mode talk. I hope that you can hear it. I really hope it. Otherwise, you see it in the speech viewer. Yes, we can get it. Perfect. Cool. That's very good to hear. So I'm going to tab now into the input field. 
programming language edit collapsed 21 options in total. Provides auto suggestions. Blank. So it is announced to us the way we hoped. Let's open it using the down key. Blank. Expanded. Tells us it's expanded now. Let's browse a little bit using the down key. Action script. Apple script. ASP. Basic. C. So this works pretty well. Closure. Let's enter a filter. So I'm selecting all of the text now. Closure selected. Deleting it. Bl all right. And now I'm entering some. J. Three of 21 options for J. Provide A. Two of 21 options for J. A. Provides auto suggestions. So it seems to work. Java. JavaScript. Very well. So as we see, going back to the presentation now, a small verdict, the element is very accessible. It only needs 60 lines of CSS and roughly 200 lines of JavaScript, including the filter functionality. But wait, there is more. There is more such unexpected usages of form controls. In our accessibility developer guide, you can learn how to create a date picker with the exact kind of same structure like we have in, in the autocomplete. You can learn how to create a tab list or a carousel or an accordion or a menu toggler. But just to give, whoops, just to give one more small example, let's look at the tab list. Opening it. In a new window. Did it work? Yes, here it is. Scrolling to the proof of concept, which is the actual example. Copy and paste it to our screen. Navigation. Reader. Speech mode off. All right. So as you can see visibly, it just looks like a very basic tab list implementation, we can use it with, with a mouse, with the keyboard. And now I'm activating the speech. Speech mode beeps, speech mode talk. Go into it again. Tab list controls grouping, show panel rows radio button checked one of three. And I can browse through them using the down or up key. Show panel tulip radio button checked two of three. Show panel sunflower radio. You get the point. So very, very simple. All right, this was quite a lot. Let's take a short moment to recap. Form controls are very powerful. They can much more than just handle basic user input and data. As we have seen, they can handle many simple usage patterns, even complex ones when combined. They are simple and compatible, robust and performant, and they are innately accessible. And as we have seen now, they can be styled as wished. So to come back to my, my introductory question, what do you trust more? Like when it comes to linking, is it a traditional A tag with an href attribute or is the span with a lot of noise around it. So please remember next time when you're tempted to glue together some random different span elements with some JavaScript handlers. Thank you a lot for your interest. If you have anything to talk about accessibility, please reach out to Joshua at nothing.ch. We can have a short virtual coffee break together or just go to our services page, nothing.ch slash accessibility. And to those who are interested into learning more about this specific topic, we will have a workshop, a, a longer workshop on 28th of July. Um, just go to tiny.cc slash GAAD21 hyphen workshop. And for those of you who are registering in the next two weeks, we have an early bird offer. You can pay what you want. You can even um, attend for free if you like. So I'm happy to see you there. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful talk. Uh, we have a few questions uh, mm -hmm. and uh, 
the first one is uh, what is the difference between uh, custom and native widgets and what to consider in terms of accessibility point of view when developing? So what I call native widgets, it, it's just like the, the standard controls that you have in your browser. You don't have to implement anything for them, kind of. You just have to use the standard HTML tags to use them, and they will work right out of the box and be accessible, right? And then you can implement your own custom solutions with, with different approaches. And it's, it's, you, you have to keep in mind then that you have to provide accessibility yourself. And area jumps into this gap. So um, it, it kind of gives you tools to, to optimize a gen generic solution. You don't need area for a traditional native widget or tag, right? So it gives you some tools which you need to know how they, they are supposed to, to be used. And then you can kind of optimize, you can polish your existing solution into an accessible one. But let me stress this out. Like in, in the previous talk was, was, was uh, said, you really need to test it using screen readers. Um, if you have someone available, an experienced screen reader user, like a blind person, please ask them to, to, to test it. I've been working in the field for eight years now, and I, I kind of, I can say, I pretty much understand pretty well now how screen readers and other assistive devices work. But um, as a beginner, please get, get yourself some help here of, of real users yeah uh, that's that's great to know i think uh Mrigen raised his hand so Mrigen, i have allowed you to uh, you can unmute yourself and ask a question if you have an, any Mrigen, are you there hi hello hello i hear you yeah Hi, this is Rashmi. Hello. Hi. Can I know what is the practice using link as button? Is it good? Or I have seen on some sites they are using link as button. Exactly. That's a very good question. Yeah. Um, in fact, links and buttons, they have different purposes. Both of them can be focused, can be interacted with, uh, they can be clicked. So they are kind of similar. But in the end, a link should take you to a new website, to a new address, while a button is there to, 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 to trigger some interactivity. So in earlier days, when buttons were not able to be styled using CSS, like in Internet Net Explorer 6 or something like that, many people just took, took links or, or even diffs um, to, to kind of mimic buttons. And I think that's, that's the background here, the history, why still some, some web experts feel that they should just use links instead of buttons. And, and that's, just, that's just not the best way, right? So if you, you want to send your user to a new website or just like a new page on your website, then you should use an anchor tag with an href attribute. And if you want to trigger some interactivity, like opening a dialogue or opening and closing a menu, then you should use a button. I hope that answers, Rashmi. Anything else? Yes. Yes. No. no. Cool. So uh, one more question that we have is, uh, you mentioned in your uh, talk as well that many seasoned developers make this mistake of... Uh, not including uh, accessibility practices in their coding. So uh, for a person who has been coding for a long time and, and has not considered to include all of these, how would you advise that person how to go about that and how to start including these practices? That's a good question. Um, so, so I don't want to make too much self-promotion here, but, but it's actually the, 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 the mission that we had when we were implementing the, the accessibility developer guide. It's, it's targeted at, at experienced users who already know a lot of web design um, and how to program and code, etc., and just want to level up their skills 
uh, and take accessibility in mind. So I, I really can advise, let me just show the slide if I find it here again. So it's this one. The accessibility developer guide, just go to accessibility slash, no, not slash, sorry, hyphen, um, developer-guide.com. And there, let me just introduce you for a moment to, to the project, because I feel it's, it's like, it's just, it's the right entry point for, for seasoned people. Right, so. So we have like this introductory part, we have the setup where you are guided through um, creating your own setup of screen readers, browsers that you will need. It's quite a lot already just to be able to do accessibility testing. You need a Windows virtual machine probably, you need the right browsers like Firefox and uh, you need screen readers. Probably you will need NVDA and JAWS, but also talk back on mobile uh, uh, and voiceover and maybe even voiceover on your Mac. So it's, it's a lot of things that you, <laughs> that you can figure out yourself. And it took us years to figure out these best practices, or you can just head over to this guide and, and implement those. And then in the next part, we have a lot of, of knowledge, like what about contrast uh, and colors? What, what are semantics anyway? I think so many seasoned web experts are using HTML and actually don't really have a clue what, what semantics are that, they are, that there even are, that they exist <laughs> in the first place. It's not optional to, to use a heading for a heading. It's, it's just how HTML was intended to be used, right? We have a section about ARIA, about uh, keyboard only usage and screen reader usage. And then we have a lot of examples, how to create uh, good heading uh, structures for your website, how to implement accessible tables, how to create forms with, with um, validation messages, et cetera, et cetera. And then the widgets. We have widgets for tooltips, tab lists, whatever. Quite a lot of things here to see. And they are meant for inspiration. Go there and be inspired and then create your own solution. Because I'm pretty sure it, it will open, it will give you quite a few um, flash bulbs in your head when you read through, through the guide. Yeah, that's a great resource. I'm definitely checking out accessibility developer guide right away. Nice. Uh, one last question for you is um, how to go about accessibility audits for websites? Like, would you want to share your experience and how do you think we should go about it? So back in the days, like eight years ago, when I started at Access for All, um, there were just, there, there were not many tools that we could use for, for, um, for audits. And we, we learned to, to do audits just manually, fire up a screen reader, test the website, try to use a website using keyboard only, look for bad contrasts, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's kind of a tool set, which is, yeah, it, it, it is quite a lot to learn in the beginning because there are other areas like, like video, you need to make sure that there are um, closed captions, uh, audio description, et cetera. Um, you can expand it to PDF. So it's quite a big world. Um, but luckily today, there are quite a few tools which assist you. And I would suggest uh, you to use a tool which does automatic testing for you in the first place, but also helps you to do manual testing. Never trust a tool which tells you, I'm going to do an audit for you and that's all you need. This is just not possible and probably will never be possible because accessibility has so much to do with, with like very distinct and and yeah it's, it's just it's a very humane topic you can't just um write some 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 technical rules and test everything automatically so i think if you really want to become a seasoned accessibility developer you will not um you will have to learn some of those tools especially how to use a screen reader 
Yeah. But, let you, but get yourself help with the automated testing tools that there are, for example, tenon.io, I guess, is a good one. There are quite a few at the moment. There are even free ones which you can run in your browser, like the Axie or X. I don't really know how to, 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 to call it uh, in, in Chrome. There are a lot of tools, too many tools, in my opinion. <laughs> but yeah, get inspired. Yeah, I mean, like a lot of developers are often worried about how fast is their website. They often do that sort of testing, but they miss to uh, do a accessibility audit. That was to great. totally, totally. I, I, I always say if, if developers or designers would invest just a fraction of the time, they invest for creating pixel perfect, beautiful, stunning visual experiences, then we would have a much better and much accessible web. <laughs> That's such a good advice. So this you raise your hand, you want to add in something or ask something? Yeah, yeah, Joshua. So there's one just question. You, yes, you, you talked about accessibility guide that you prepared, but so do we do you have any reusable pattern library that you have created using the native HTML? Um, uh, you know, that is really helpful to some some you know the budding developer or something of that sort. Yes, we do. Um, not in the sense that it's just like a JavaScript library that, that you can, can just uh, like link to from your website, but all of our topics that we have in our accessibility developer guide, they have real, real life examples in there. Very simple, for example, the headings examples, a, a good heading example, just very basic headings, just to get a picture of what are good headings. Then we go more deeply into the topic. We, we show how to visually hide headings so, so that a heading structure still makes sense, but does not distract the visual, um, the visual appearance. And all of these, head, of these examples you can click on, and then you have them like traditional HTML elements that you can play with, that you can interact with using a screen reader. It's all made for kind of creating the smallest pieces and bits that are important and relevant from an accessibility perspective. So that even users who are very, who do not have a lot of experience can just play with it and see and look into the DOM and, and see what JavaScript is doing there. So they can see what is going on in the end. So you get a lot of, of inspiration here but it's not something that you can just copy and paste to your own project, kind of. Does this answer your question? Yeah, I think it was great. One last question. I think your presentation was so awesome that pe uh, people want to ask a lot of questions yeah, cool. and they have appreciated you in the chats as well. Uh, so one last question from Krishna. Uh, he goes on to say that when developers are working on legacy systems and there's a limitation that you can't use semantic elements, how to go about with that? And in continuation of the same, he says that uh, on the contrary, when you're using uh, external JavaScript API like ReactJS or any open UI framework, uh, they automatically provide div blocks to the DOM tree for any semantic control. So how can you restrict that? Yeah, these are two important questions. So the first question, if you are implementing a, a web app or website for, for a legacy system, you should stick to the selection <laughs> of, of features that are kind of provided by this legacy system. It kind of, it feels absurd to me to, 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 uh, to, to have to wish to, to create a full-fledged modern application inside a, <laughs> a restricted um, environment, right? So I would rather try to rethink whether those features that you are trying to implement are actually needed and rather adapt the usability and the, the interaction patterns to the, yeah, just to the, the basic basis that you have with, with your system. And as you have seen, I mean, radio buttons and stuff like that, they were here like de decades ago. You can do a lot of stuff with those. Probably it's not the legacy systems which introduced the problems, but just like 
bad coding or like unaware coding and trying to to pack too many fancy interactive options into um, your project which in the end might not not be even necessary which in the end might even be like confusing to many users because they don't know how oh, drag and drop what's that uh, uh, oh my god i'd rather just have a button here and a, a native drop down there and that's all that i need i don't need any flashing and moving around stuff <laughs> I th yeah I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit but, but i think you get the point and the second question this is one of the the main problems i, I guess that many seasoned web frameworks from google for, uh, angular uh, view what, what you, you can can na name all of those react many of them i mean they are trying they, they are creating better experiences today that then that they than they did a few years ago but still a lot of them are just sorry that i said they are just creating shitty html <laughs> and it's kind of the only thing that we can do there is to, to, to make those people more aware of the topic, I guess, and, and try to, to push the topic inside those communities. That's more or less, if you try to, to, to optimize such bad code and throw in a little bit of ARIA here and a little bit of semantics there, usually it's not gonna become much better. It, sometimes it's getting even worse. <laughs> Yeah, that was helpful. Thank you so much, Joshua, for such a wonderful presentation. We You're really loved it. And thank you for tuning in. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. And sign up for the workshop if you're interested. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much, Joshua. It was a lovely talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. OK, so moving on to the next talk, uh, we have uh, Apurva Kulkarni. Uh, he is from Ola and he has been working with accessibility a lot. I, I would ask him to share the fun fact when he, uh, when the stage is his. So uh, if, you sh if you could share a fun fact, that would be great. And uh, yeah, a warm welcome to Apurva Kulkarni. Thanks, Anisha. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you are. Thank you so much for the warm welcome. Uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, uh, wherever you guys are joining in from. And um, uh, so excited to be a part of the uh, Hello ALNY uh, celebration for the 10th Global Accessibility Awareness Day. Um, I can see that there's a wonderful lineup and um, I'm th I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting um, us from Ola Mobility Institute over here to give a presentation. Uh, I'm gonna apologize uh, uh, right out uh, at the outset, uh, we I have a poor network over here, and uh, so I'll, I'll be keeping my camera off. But I assure you, you're not missing anything. Um, uh, so uh, uh, just kind of bear with me for a while. Uh, start the presentation. I'm sorry, I. I yeah, you want me to start the presentation? Am I audible? Yeah, yeah, you are. Yeah, sure, 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 please. Okay, just a second. Okay. Um, so, and Tanisha, uh, in case I drop off, um, maybe the connection breaks, would you just let me know so that I can maybe repeat if there's anything necessary? Yeah, sure, sure. Okay, cool. <clears throat> so, um, I'll be speaking about urban transport accessibility. Uh, this is a topic very close to my heart. Um, and um, um, Tanisha has already mentioned, uh, I'd just like to make a small correction. I work with the Ola Mobility Institute. And uh, for those of you who uh, don't know about the Institute, we are a think tank, uh, which works at the intersection of uh, mobility, innovation, and public good. Um, we include, uh, we, we focus on areas like accessibility and inclusion. We also do work around urban mobility, electric mobility, energy, future of work, uh, platform economy, and so on and so forth. I had uh, accessibility and inclusion at the Institute. Um, while we are uh, funded by Ola, we uh, maintain 
uh, an independent operation. And what that means is uh, we, we really don't influence business operations, um, business decisions, strategic uh, decisions, or customer uh, kind of you know, service um, aspects of the uh, of Ola operation. So unfortunately, kind of you know, uh, if, if you have any feedback on that count, I'll be happy to pass it on, but I might not be the right person to action on that. Um, so with that, uh, uh, let's start. Uh, maybe next slide. So, uh, you know, most of you would be aware that uh, we have a large population of persons with disability and um, there are multiple sources and multiple figures right from census 2011, which, um, which quotes a figure of 26.8 million. And, uh, you know, you have global disability rates of 15%, uh, percent, which when applied, uh, gives a figure of roughly 180 million. And uh, may maybe the number of persons with disability is somewhere near that. Uh, the, the latest conservative estimates that comes from non-government sources um, uh, is around 100 million. And uh, uh, in, most li in all likelihood, this is an underrepresentation. Um, in 2016, as you all would, have, would know, India passed um, Rights of Persons with Disabilities Act, and we recognize 21 disabilities under that, which is an increment from the earlier act of, from 1995, which recognized seven disabilities. That's the act which uh, was referred to when the census was done. So uh, in all likelihood, the number of uh, persons with disability uh, in the next census would be uh, much higher. And but the important fact is it's, it's a large uh, population. And uh, it's about 10% of our, our kind of, you know, um, citizens over here. And so <clears throat> the needs of persons with disabilities are certainly important. Next slide. Are you there? Hi, sorry about this. Um, am I audible now? Yeah, yeah, you are. Yes, okay. yes. Um, did I just drop off and the slide changed? Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, just like any non-disabled person, persons with disability also uh, require safe, accessible, reliable, and affordable means of transportation. Transportation is really a catalyst. It, it uh, enables access to a variety of operation, uh, opportunities, right from social and cultural, uh, you know, uh, seeing a family member or going out with friends for dinner. Um, I know something that we all would be missing uh, given the times that we are living in right now to um, educational opportunities, really interacting at a school with uh, other peers, uh, employment, healthcare, and what have you. Um, it's really um, a tool which is helping to unlock the full value of human potential. And um, uh, we've already seen how lack of physical interaction, how uh, breakdown of transportation is really destructive to economy, but also destructive to mental health and quality of life that uh, people are used to living. And therefore, um, the, the importance of transportation cannot be um, you know, diminished really. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Um, if, if you were to think about what's the cost of uh, exclusion of persons with disability, uh, there's a ILO work paper which estimates the cost which can be as high as 7% of GDP. Uh, this is basically when workers, when persons with disabilities are kept out of employment or are underemployed. And it's a huge figure, right? So 7% of GDP is roughly um, $140 billion. And uh, to, to just kind of you know, give you a perspective, it's 28 times of the money that's been allocated towards uh, procuring vaccines by the government, which is about $5 billion or 35,000 crore rupees. And uh, just imagine the magnitude that we are losing in, in, in form of uh, economic dividend when we disallow people to uh, function at their fullest. And again, um, because transportation is such an important part uh, which enables and facilitates this, uh, we are really losing out on that in form of lost productivity of uh, persons with disability uh, themselves, but also their carers who otherwise could have been engaged in more productive activities and uh, generated uh, value for the economy. Next slide. 
um and um government also realizes this so you know uh, over a period of time there have been various measures that have been introduced uh, in 2015 for example uh, narendra modi government introduced uh, the accessible india campaign under which um, airports railway stations and public transport was expected to be made accessible by 2019 the target got pushed uh, later to 2020 um and due to various reasons including covid we've not seen much progress on that uh, but uh, kind of you know we we do see uh, some work in that direction both on the physical and the digital side next slide we have the government of delhi which introduced 1000 uh, buses fitted with hydraulic ramps uh, which were expected to ease mobility for uh, persons with disability uh, and particularly locomotor disability um next slide we also have a uh, government of goa which introduced wheelchair accessible buses so that it reduces dropouts um um uh, in school going children uh, and while all of these measures are appreciable and uh, you know uh, they they are helping to move the needle in the right direction i think uh, there's a miss over here and that's primarily because these measures don't work in silos um they, they're not delivering the full value for the buck next slide please um at uh, ola mobility institute we really take a trip lens uh, trip chain lens when it comes to uh, transportation and mobility um we believe that the the transport experience is not limited to the period that you step into a vehicle and step out at your at destination it really starts from the planning process wherein uh, you you kind of you know figure out how do you want to get from play, point a to point b which mode of transport do you use when do you leave your um, house or office and um is there any uh, a reason to change uh, a mode of transport so let's say kind of you know change a bus or change uh, trains um in metro or local train um uh, should you take a, a rickshaw and auto how does uh, price uh, figure into these decisions is it a daytime night time all of this to and goes on from there to uh, really kind of you know getting to the boarding spot be it a train station or a, or a bus stop or a rickshaw stand um it it covers the process wherein you get into the vehicle the in transit experience the experience that you have when you de- uh, disembark from the vehicle um uh, it, when it comes to payment and uh, complaint resolution and what have you so it's an entire trip chain and that's what's kind of you know missing when uh, when government has introduced some of these measures because while for example there is a wheelchair accessible bus um the information around that may not be available as easily to people who need it or for that matter the approach path from one's house to the bus depot uh, may not be available or uh, in your other other factors might be at play over here right so we really need to take a trip chain lens um, and ensure that transportation uh, is safe accessible reliable and affordable from end to end next next uh, slide please so uh when you uh, let's let's take a few examples when it comes to um accessibility across uh, the trip chain take take example of uh, information availability uh when it comes to transportation you have various offline and online modes um offline you may have uh, bus schedules or uh, or train schedules displayed on a board in form of a map or a or a route or in form of a um, uh, kind of you know uh list uh you have various on- online um uh, tools like websites apps uh information and communication systems um uh, but very often they are lacking um uh, because they they may not deliver on perhaps one of the factors it it may not have timely and relevant information um and this is the all the more evident in times of covid so for example um every once in a while uh, one of our chief uh, ministers or, or, or other government officials come and uh, make a detailed presentation and um um explain how they have they are deciding to impose certain restrictions around movement of people around transportation but um i for example i am in maharashtra and i have not seen uh, these presentations being accompanied by sign language videos uh which alienates a large uh, section of the population uh from the deaf and hard of hearing community uh later when a detailed notification is released uh it's not released in a format that's accessible using screen readers and so again you are uh, not informing um uh, people who live with visual disability or who may be 
relying on other assistive technology to um, access that information. And, and this is really catching people off guard because they find themselves unprepared to function in an environment with additional restrictions, which, which are ever changing really. Uh, we've already talked, uh, touched upon accessibility in some form. There also needs to be information that's uh, relevant uh, given your nature of disability. So for example, if uh, my nearest metro train is, um, is having restrictions around the entry paths, um, I need to know if the uh, entry path that I take, which has a ramp um, as, a, as a wheelchair user, is going to be closed down or is going to be open, if there's going to be any other restriction that I'll have to uh, figure out. So some of this information is really missing. And that breaks down the process for, um, uh, for transportation when it comes to an independent uh, travel experience. Next slide, please. Sorry, uh, can we go back? One more. Uh, sorry, okay, my screen actually froze. I think we, uh, next slide. Yeah, next one. Perfect. And <clears throat> When, it, when we talk of the next phase, which is getting to the boarding spot, we all have experienced how our footpaths and roads are in a state of disrepair. Uh, they are not accessible, uh, whether you are a person living with locomotor disability, visual disability, or a non-disabled person. Um, and um, you know, that's, that's really destructive <clears throat> for an experience. This becomes all the more relevant in today's time when people are expected to maintain social distancing. Um, when one has to negotiate through crowd, uh, trying to avoid contact, trying to avoid getting exposed or avoid exposure if you are a asymptomatic carrier, uh, it's really difficult to manage that. Um, earlier, when, uh, when accessibility of physical environment broke down, uh, you often had people who were, um, who were willing to assist you. But now, given the fear around COVID uh, viruses, you, you have people um, kind of, you know, not coming up to help as much as before, um, which which kind of you know flies in the face of independent living in the first place, but also um, kind of you know destroys confidence of of those uh, who set out to travel to work or otherwise. Um, we also have you kind know, of family members who are equally concerned, and it, it reduces confidence level of those people. And so th this is really an experience that we'd like to avoid uh, uh, for all all the users, whether uh, you live with a disability or not. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, you know, whether COVID or otherwise, you also have um, another nuisance, which is stray animals. Um, you have dogs and bulls, uh, which often kind of an attack persons with disability. Um, so I, I, for example, live with a visual disability myself, and I have many friends in the community. And I have firsthand seen how dogs get threatened when they see a white cane, because, uh, you know, certainly a cane does not have a have a pleasant uh, association in their brains and uh, they bark, they attack. During COVID times, this has become all the more problematic because street dogs, which, which earlier su survived on kind of, you know, uh, food being uh, thrown away at them or, or fed to them by bystanders or uh, uh, kind of, you know, from garbage uh, that gets collected outside the shops or restaurants, et cetera, they, they are not finding food and they're getting all the more aggressive. So even when kind of, you, know, you have the best of the uh, facilities available, these small um, aspects, which, uh, which may not appear significant by itself, um, is an accident waiting to happen. And you've seen, kind of, you know, even before COVID, you have exp uh, examples published in the news media, wherein a bull, for example, has attacked a person with disability. There's been other um, challenges. Um, we, we've had kind of, you know, students in, in very reputed universities um, face these constraints. And um, again, like, you know, this, is, this really makes it a very inaccessible experience, unsafe experience for one to even walk up to the boarding spot. Next slide, please. Uh, and the reason all of this is important because you know, it, it affects the more choice preferences that you might have. Um, and even though, for example, you have an accessible metro station or uh, a cab that you can uh, uh, hail from the street or a bus, uh, these these experiences may um, may kind of you know, force you to choose modes that you otherwise wouldn't have chosen for uh, for want of affordability or price points, or for that matter, you might uh, recruit help of friends and family members or hire a driver, which is uh, an expensive affair enough itself. But also, um, you know, um, as I mentioned, flies in the face of independent living, and you really don't want to do that, especially in times of today when. 
everyone is overworked trying to handle multiple uh, domestic and uh, and professional responsibilities uh, people may be unwell they might not be they, they whether covid or otherwise there is kind of a lot of pressure and you want to avoid that so you you really need um, an infrastructure that's supportive of independent living and uh, which is safe accessible reliable um, which promotes affordability next slide please even when you get at a boarding spot uh, the trouble is many of the vehicles are inaccessible so when it comes to en uh, entrances of um, of let's say train stay, train uh, you can see from examples over here displayed on the screen how the train is at a level uh, much higher than the platform and so as a wheelchair user you may not be able to climb it uh, 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 the train uh, similarly for bus you have uh, instances wherein there is no ramp even when there is a ramp people are not um, able to uh, operate it because of uh, because either the the staff is not aware how to how to use it or because it's been unused for such a long time that uh, it's not well maintained uh, and uh, you know like these problems are very common uh, there are also changes in uh, bus schedules these days which uh, which in, in absence of accessible information um, kind of you know uh, throws planning in the toss um, for for many this is a problem but especially for people who live with intellectual disability because for many of them they have trained themselves to operate um, uh, along a standard operating procedure really and when when there's a change in the bus schedule when the the bus that they're not used to comes in uh when when the conductor is unfamiliar to them uh they really get confused and it affects their productivity and uh, ability to participate in experiences and uh, uh and that's that's kind of you know that's that's a uh, challenge really next slide please uh for for many uh, people uh, when we interview them we realize that you know the the denial of transportation can be very very stark so um when we interviewed uh, some women from the national association of blind uh, they explained how the buses won't even stop for them uh, when when it's just for, uh, the disabled women the blind women uh, waiting for it and uh, you know there's there's a lot of attribution over here one is that as as most of you would know that uh, persons with disability are entitled to travel uh, free of cost on uh, uh, in a bus when they procure a pass and pay an annual fee um, and that that kind of you know affects the ticket sales uh, which puts pressure on the conductors and the drivers and so they they rather have someone who's going to buy a ticket then um, ferry someone who's living with a disability and uh, risk losing one passenger right there's also a stigma associated with it which uh, is all the more magnified because for many people uh, disability and disease um, have a mental association and that's um, that kind of you know um, denies the opportunity to even travel next slide please when you speak of the in transit phase so you know this is the time that you have entered the vehicle you are traveling and it's it's going from point a to point b there are variety of challenges that may come about uh, which range from attitudinal barriers lead uh, as a result of lack of training and sensitization on the parts of drivers conductors and uh, co passengers um, you you have instances of harassment wherein under the guise of uh, being helpful you have uh, you know disabled women being uh groped and uh, uh and kind of you know uh, physically harassed um e uh, for for persons with disability and women in particular this is all the uh, all a bigger issue because you know if you were to think about a non disabled person this is not a pleasant experience or a, or a forget pleasant like acceptable experience even for them but for uh, for let's say a non disabled woman uh without without trying to dismiss the severity of situation uh she um has an option of let's say exiting the vehicle uh, uh midway or for that matter jumping off if the situation becomes that extreme uh, for a person with disability and women um, um in particular you really don't have that uh, option because imagine if let's say you are living with a locomotor disability how will you escape that situation where will you go if you are some someone who's living with blindness probably you may be able to jump off but now in which direction do you escape and how do you manage uh, to get away from your assailant and that's a real threat uh, which kind of you know 
um, um, takes away from the safety aspect of uh, a mode of transport, uh, really. The constant changes also um, disrupt the, the, uh, the, the travel experience for persons with disability, those with intellectual disability, for example, as I mentioned earlier, but also other disabilities because uh, you know you you you've uh, memorized the route information you uh, you're relying on your other senses and so let's say when there is a rerouting uh, that happens uh, on account of uh, road construction or on account of any other reason it's really disorienting for people uh, earlier uh, when covid was uh, not a reality that we lived with there was a chance that you could ask a co passenger and uh, take assistance from them these days, that's not an option that's very often available to you, um, either because you don't want to uh, get exposed or because uh, the other people um, are afraid to come forth and help you. And that's, again, kind of, you know, taking away from the travel experience and the independence, really. Next slide, please. Um, I'm going to skip disembarking because um, the experiences are very similar to boarding and also um, the the experiences that speak that uh, come about when you dis exit the vehicle and uh, maybe like trans go towards your destination ultimate destination i want to speak about payments right now uh, for a long time uh, digital payments have received a lot of emphasis which is which is good in a way because you know uh, you have the opportunity to make these transactions accessible um, cash has received uh, less and less uh, kind of, you know, uh, 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 I guess like a preference, the, the preference for digital has increased uh, in the COVID times. The troubles uh, arises when, you know, design choices make uh, these instruments inaccessible. So over here, uh, you, you would have um, a photograph of a, um, a credit card machine, uh, a POS terminal, point of sales terminal, which is a touchscreen instrument. And when I, as um, a visually challenged person, wants to enter my PIN, I'm not able to do that. Um, and this is a this is a true story. For example, on my part, that when we when I'd gone to purchase some consumer durables and the amount was significant, um, the the POS terminal was a touch screen, so um, I was not confident if the the amount keyed in was correct. Um, am I gonna kind of you know be overcharged by any chance? Um, and uh, that, that destroys the experience. Similarly, when it comes to vending machines or uh, kiosks for tickets for a for a uh, you know like contactless experience really or, or experience that, that's separate from human interaction uh, many of the times these um, these experiences are these um, interactions are not accessible and that again kind of you know disables you because you're not able to buy a ticket to uh, for, for your journey um, as also many of the mobile apps that are used for payments um, um, may, may not be accessible either fully or partially um, very often, when these apps are updated um, uh, from time to time, there is something um, that breaks in in terms of accessibility, and you have to, uh, you know, you you walked out of the house relying on the on the assumption that um, the app that was useful yesterday, the payment experience that was accessible yesterday, is not accessible anymore, and that's something that kind of you know lands lands you up in trouble. Um, so you have you have a lot of scope for improvement when it comes to payment, and there's a lot of opportunity over here to make experiences accessible and affordable. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Yeah. So um, I'd like to <clears throat> you know like close by speaking about some uh, recommendations for this uh, when it comes to this. Um, to begin with, I think we there's an urgent need for. Uh, information, data points that are disaggregated by gender, age, and disability. Uh, unless we have that information that's timely, that's reliable, that's accurate, um, effective transport planning uh, may not be possible. Um, so we, we need information not just about population, but we also need information on uh, uh, travel uh, data for persons with disability, obviously in an anonymized, disaggregated way, which does not intrude on someone's privacy. Uh, but this information is important because then policymakers uh, would be forced to take notice and put in measures that are accessible. Uh, right now, we are a really uh, invisible population in some ways, and uh, uh, kind of you know that that keeps us from having access experiences that are safe, accessible, reliable, and affordable. Uh, the next one is uh, we need standards for accessible transport. 
which would provide guidance to the operators uh, in terms of creation of experience and also establish baseline on as to which uh, what elements of transportation will make um, things accessible for persons with disability. Um, right now, in absence of that, you you may not even even well intentioned. Uh, um, what do you call? It? Operators might be at loss to where as to where to start, right? So that's that's an important um, element that's kind of you know missing. We would want uh, SARA, which is safety, accessibility, reliability, and affordability, to be a core tenant and a mandatory condition for awarding government contracts. Uh, government in spending has uh, goals beyond returns uh, on investment. They have development goals, and um, as a as a large buyer with significant spending. Uh, it has um, the power to use public policy to influence um, you know, market dynamics. So if this was an essential condition for government contracts, we would have um, um, kind of you know, effects on the supply side wherein people would be incentivized to create safe, accessible, affordable, um, reliable experiences when it comes to transportation, infrastructure, vehicles, uh, operations, and what have you. So that's that's something that's uh, very important. Um, we we've, we've spoken uh, a little bit about the the uh, you know travel subsidy that persons with disability get, for example, in the bus systems, and what are the unwanted side effects of those. Um, you also have uh, governments kind of you know, announce subsidies for uh, or kind of you know, free travel for women from time to time or any other measures. We really have an opportunity over here to use the digital infrastructure that's created, the India stack that's in place to, um, to mobilize these subsidies uh, in a digital way, uh, which, will, which will help in um, kind of you know, record keeping, which will help in data creation uh, that will be then useful for planning purposes, but also which will uh, disincentivize people from, for example, denying service to uh, persons with disability and other marginalized communities. Um, Lastly, um, we need we need a supply side intervention as well from the from the government. And over here, uh, we would want uh, the government to announce certain incentives, which would which, which would kind of you know push the uh, uh, supply side, which are transport operators, automobile manufacturers, and um, other players, to create experiences that are uh, accessible. Um, right now, right now that uh, the, the trouble that kind of you know often occurs. Uh, uh, through our conversations with uh, business owners is that they they try and make a decision on a cost and return basis, right? uh, return on investment basis. And uh, in absence of credible data, in absence of information around purchasing power, in absence about market size, uh, they, they, they are less um, inclined to take decisions that are, that, that which they agree are right, but they're not prioritizing that. And so incentives on that front would help kickstart the process, which uh, which we've seen help happen in other places. For example, when uh, the government wanted to incentivize digital payments, it capped the uh, the merchant discount rate or the fees that credit card um, uh, accepting um, merchants are taking um, are paying for that matter uh, to incentivize its its adoption. And so we need some some incentives like that, which may range from uh, tax breaks or any other kind of incentives. Um, and so that's that's another recommendation that uh, we have for the for the policy makers and market participants. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so that's that's all that uh, we have for you over here. Um, and also before before kind of you know, we open up for Q and A, um, I'd like to share some information about an upcoming report from the Ola Mobility Institute, which goes much more in depth along the the lines that we spoke about. We have partnered with over nine um, organizations working for the empowerment of persons with disability with a collective um, experience of more than 175 years. Uh, we have engaged in uh, semi-structured interviews and focused group discussions with persons with disabilities across uh, three, uh, three groups, namely persons living with locomotor disability, persons living with visual disability, and members of deaf and hard of hearing community to understand their travel experiences. Uh, across uh, various modes of transport, including metros and local trains, uh, along buses and uh, auto rickshaws and uh, uh, taxis, uh, whether you hail it um, offline uh, in, uh, or you hail it through a mobile aggregator. 
um, and uh, it has some really uh, interesting insights. I'm sure that will be useful for uh, policymakers, businesses, and also um, accessibility champions such as yourself. So um, I request you to keep an eye on that. If you are interested uh, in getting a copy, I request you to put your uh, contact information in the chat box, and uh, we try and kind of you know uh, ensure that. Uh, a copy is sent to you directly uh, upon its release uh, shortly. Um, and yeah, we, um, so we're really excited about that. With that, I'd like to thank, uh, thank you folks and uh, welcome any questions which you may have. Thank you, Apurva. And, and before before you start, I think uh, Tanisha, a special thanks to you for running the slides for me. Um, uh, it's been a big help um, because of the, especially because of the poor network at my end. Thank you so much. No problem. No problem. You can uh, uh, everybody can drop in their uh, details in the chat box if you want to get the copy of the research by Ola Mobility Institute that Apur was talking about. I don't think we have any questions, but uh, people are really appreciating you in the chat saying it was a great presentation and a lot of insights. Thank you, thank you, Tanisha. I really appreciate it. Um, and once again, thank you uh, to all the organizers of uh, Hello A11 by um, uh, for giving us the opportunity to uh, share our research, share our findings. Um, and welcoming us um, uh, to make a presentation on the tenth Global Accessibility Awareness Day. Would you Would you want me to hang out for uh, hang around for a couple of minutes, or? Yeah, you can actually you can actually uh, stay. Uh, I mean, people will reach out to you if they have any questions, and you could also so drop you... actually your email. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you already did. You could uh, maybe drop some Twitter or so that people can reach out to you later as well if they have any questions. Okay, um, so I have my colleague, Devendra, would you be please able to uh, drop in that information on the chat box, please? It's also, uh, if you if you um, kind of you know, display the slides again, it's the information is displayed on the screen. I'm guessing it may not be accessible for those of us who are using screen readers, uh, but for others, it might be available easily. Uh, nonetheless, we will uh, drop the information in chat box and we welcome uh, uh, any <clears throat> interaction from you, we would love to connect with you and uh, understand more about your own experiences and uh, how we can improve um, our own research practices. And uh, as also, as I mentioned, I share the research paper that coming up very shortly. I've also shared a link of HasGeek uh, where you can drop in your comments or any questions that you have and the speakers can maybe answer it later. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was a wonderful session. Thank you, Tanisha. Okay, so do we have our next speaker already? We have Sukriti. Yes, yes. Oh, okay. Cool. So uh, the next talk is uh, about, let me quickly. Yeah, so the next talk is about, this is actually one of my favorite talks. And yeah, I'm, I'm expecting more from this session. Uh, so this is going to be on accessible charts using music and haptics. And uh, we have uh, Sukriti and Yatin uh, who will be sharing their knowledge. And to say about a bit introduction about them is Sukriti is an engineer turned product manager. And uh, Yatin is a New York-based Android developer focused on providing the best user experience uh, at Yahoo Finance. So yeah, uh, over to you, both of you. Hi, can uh, everyone who's uh, um, uh, able to hear, hear us? Yes, yes. Awesome. Let me share my screen. Um, are you seeing this, the first slide? Yep. Awesome. 
Good evening, everyone, and welcome to a presentation titled uh, Accessible Charts Using Music and Haptics. Uh, my name is Sukriti, as Manjula already said, I'm a product manager at Spotify at the moment. Uh, previously, I worked at Yahoo Finance as a product manager and before that as an Android engineer. Um, we are also joined today by Yaten, who is uh, the star developer lead on this project, who will be speaking about implementation details um, uh, in just a bit. Another special thanks to Larry Goldberg and the accessibility team at Verizon Media for uh, supporting this project and advising incessantly on um, everything that went into making this happen. And also thank you to the Hello A11Y team um, uh, for giving us this opportunity to present. All right, let's get to it. So in today's agenda, we'll be covering the motivation for this project, what led to uh, the problem statement, how we discovered uh, what were the most pressing concerns for users uh, with real users with uh, low vision or blindness, and then we'll get into some of the more design specific elements of how um, we decided to add the feature set that we finally ended up with. Uh, there is also a newer, new ish announcement as of last week, which is not part of the presentation, but um, because it's so recent that Yatin will, uh, will share with us. Um, we'll share the Android architecture diagram. Um, I'll be showing you a demo in just a bit. Uh, this project is also open sourced. Uh, which we'll also get to in the implementation part and some of the next um, steps we'd, we'd like to take as, um, as, as a community and team uh, to take this further. So to give a little bit of context, finance charts are essentially um, one of the central pieces of um, a, a stock charts app or a stock app or a finance app, which, is, which was the initial motivation for making um, uh, the accessible charts feature. And if we think about it, charts quickly render in terms, in terms of the status quo. And charts in finance is just one application of data visualization. This overall concept can be applied to a lot more platforms other than mobile and also a lot of other data visualizations other than line charts, for example. So to take a step back and assess the status quo, Charts quickly render hundreds of data points that help us analyze trends. In the finance context, it is movement of a stock's price. Charts are great for people who can see or, or who can see well. They can quickly identify key markers such as domain, range, and the data points and points of interest at a glance. For visually impaired users, however, to rely, who rely on screen readers to access information on digital devices, it is not as straightforward. Most charts or data visualizations only have a label similar to that for an image with no way to meaningfully interact with the data. In the charts considered accessible today, the status quo is for screen readers to read the data points as XY, 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 as it would be in a tabular format. This is problematic on at least two levels. One, after about five or eight data points, it is difficult for the user to keep a mental image or a mental picture of the trend shown on the chart, which is the entire point of it. And second, on the spectrum of low vision to blind users, it's cognitively disruptive and inconsistent to see a chart on the screen and hear a table from the screen reader. Users with low vision face similar challenges to data visualizations across multiple domains one of the most important of which, and one of the most impactful of which is education. This is one of the reasons we chose to open source the solution so we can make this technique available to developers and designers that work on education software among other areas. Next, we'll talk about the challenges related, and these are some of the design challenges related to accessible data visualizations, and especially charts for low vision and, and blind users. And the solution essentially combines music and more specifically tones that scale and map to human audible frequency, which basically means as the stock price goes up and down, so does the pitch of the associated tones. And we have haptic and spoken feedback and a seamless transition, which we'll show in a demo later between those modalities. Note that this solution is for Android, but the same or similar solution is also available on the Yao Finance iOS app. 
The Android part is open sourced, however, but the solution in itself is very extensible to desktop and other platforms. So some of the design considerations that you'll see or notice in the demo uh, coming up are as follows. In about eight user studies during the discovery phase, uh, uh, which we did with eight blind users, we validated that beyond a handful of data points, it becomes challenging for users to create that mental picture we spoke about. Another important point that we learned was spatial recognition on the device was challenging. By this, we mean if we tap a certain point on the mobile device, as a sighted user, tapping that same point again is pretty straightforward. For a blind user, however, it is not as straightforward to spatially recognize that same coordinates or, or the same X, Y on the given screen, which is why we chose to make the chart experience a full screen experience. So you know the start and end of the chart is the same as the start and end of the actual device. The solution or the gist of it is the data points are mapped to a range of human audible tones that convey relative values of the time series. As the Y value increases, the pitch of the tone go up and vice versa. Since this was implemented on mobile, we also used haptic feedback to indicate points of interest, which in the finance use case are the highest of, of the time range that you've chosen, the lowest, the previous close and the current stock price. As a user scrubs through the chart, and on Android that means sliding with two fingers, they can hear tones corresponding to data points that the user or the pointer is focused on. At any point when they decide to stop and explore an area, more granularly, they can release the pointer and the screen reader will announce the last data point they were on. From here, the users can focus back and forth on data points preceding and following that particular point as they would in a table, which is what the status quo has made them used to so far. Visually, however, it will be consistent because the overall chart is divided into in invisible panels, each of which represents a data point. So when they're looking at one, one data point on the x-axis, the thing that's being read to them is also visually consistent for users with low vision and not necessarily blindness. When the user is overall scrubbing the chart, one, one, an, an additional thing we do is give haptic feedback on the points of interest, which is the high, low, previous close, and current stock price to indicate that there is something interesting there. After the first round of user studies, we validated that this solution works for um, the set of users that we were aiming to improve the experience for. And as we'll see in, after the demo, about 80% of the participants were able to draw the overall trend of the chart by using the solution, which was really encouraging to see. Another design consideration that went in was the overall uh, description or, or, or the label of the chart that includes things like the X and Y axis range. The heading structure is also really important to note. If you if we notice in the in the status quo chart or what all users see, you'll see the time ranges are at the bottom of the chart. Whereas in the accessible charts, full screen experience, the time range buttons are at the top. So the user doesn't have to waste time interacting with the chart before they before they get to pick uh, the range they're most interested in. So these are some of the optimizations we made to customize the experience for a low vision or blind user. Another functionality that we'll maybe get to hear in the in the demo, it's not as clear um, unless you use it on the actual device, is there is a different texture to the stock price above versus below the previous close, which is something that is visually marked in financial charts, and we tried to do it with um, an audio signal. Lastly, one of the most important lessons we learned during the research and development of this process was that users want a nuanced customizable solution that works for them in their unique context. We, that, this is uh, the reason why we added the, the ability to change the pitch or the uh, frequencies that the user is most comfortable hearing. Another, uh, another point of personalization is the time, uh, is the data, date, date point format, 
which means that the time can be read as the 1st of January 2021 or just January 1st or just 1st to make it as concise or as verbose as the user prefers. Let's watch the demo now. I'm gonna share my YouTube screen. Uh, if you could let me know that that's working, that would be great. Do you see the YouTube screen? Yeah, then can you give me a thumbs up? I can see you. Yeah, we can. BZ. Three months chart. Double tap to explore. Double tap to activate. BZ three months chart trending up. Current price 59.75. Previous close 57.63. High 59.96. Low 55.59. Swipe or drag two fingers across the chart to explore. Double tap to activate. The 2nd of September 2019, 59.06, enlist 15 items. August 26, 2019, 58.16. August 19, 2019, 55.92. The 12th of August 2019, 56.65. BZ three months chart. Settings. Navigate up button. Double tap to act. Settings. Double tap to activate. Cool. That, that was the demo, uh, and which basically shows how all of these elements come together. And this is the response from the user studies that we were speaking about. These, these are the actual drawings from a, a subset of the users we tested with. Um, and on the bottom left is the, the reference chart that uh, we represented with this audio solution and a majority of the users were actually able to draw with varying levels of accuracy, the um, trend of the charts. Next, we have Yatin to talk about uh, how this was implemented and, and more of the, the meat of the solution. Over to you, Yatin. Great. Thank you, Supriti. Appreciate it. So on Android, we approached this feature by creating a new custom view that would draw the chart and overlay it with the list of points. Uh, to use Android terminology, we used Canvas um, to draw the chart and a recycler view to populate the list of points. Uh, each point in that list would have a description containing its price and timestamp. Uh, and using Android's talkback feature um, or screen reader, uh, it would um, allow these descriptions to be read out loud as the user focused on a data point and swiped over to the next one. The user can also press down two fingers to interact with the trend line and hear tones play out loud. Uh, and the pitch of these tones uh, would match the point's relative position in the chart. We've extracted this audio chart view into its own project. So any developer would be able to pick up this chart and place it into their app and load it by providing it with the list of data point view models that we have defined. They can act upon the chart to do certain things like play a summary audio of all of the data points. The chart takes care of the scrubbing and the releasing gestures. And when you're done using the chart in code, you would dispose of it to clean up any resources. Next slide. So earlier uh, last year, uh, we open sourced this project titled Songbird for other Android app developers to use if they were interested. Uh, and if you're interested in checking it out, the link to the GitHub repository is on this slide. Please feel free to leave any comments or open an issue. We're always open to any feedback and we thank you for it. We also got some direct user feedback through the App Store that the charts were pretty awesome and that the next big, big things could be accessible indicators, which is an advanced charting feature. Um, and this user appreciated the uh, let me see. This user appreciated uh, the fact that they would be able to get into the Forex market uh, for the first time. They felt like that's a very real possibility and a very real show. Um, yeah. That's another and on Twitter, we had a user share our Android demo 
and they said that they had never seen this method before and it's probably the most unique accessibility solution to a problem that they've seen in a while. And they also state that translating graphs to tones is pretty trippy and I'm assuming in a good way. So some of the next steps that we've wanted to take for a while were to use the pentatonic scale to make the tones a little bit more pleasant to listen to. The built-in tone generator uh, that Android provides isn't as pleasant to listen to. Um, another integration that we wanted to look into uh, was having it integrate with Google Assistant. So, you know, a user could ask the assistant, play the audio for this stock's performance today. Um, and we want to continue development of the open source library and get word out there, get some feedback from real users or other developers to see how we can improve and increase the feature set for this for this project. Although um, for the first point, uh, as, as of I believe last week, we have a new version of this project using piano tones, which is far more pleasant to listen to. Um, it uses the sharp keys or the black keys on the piano, which in any order would sound pleasant to listen to. So as you scrub through, the different scale of that tone will play according to the, um, the trend of the chart. But if you prefer the pitch range and, and the other tones, because you have a little bit more control over it, you can use an older version of the, of the project and still have that. Um, but now you do have that option to use piano tones, which I believe is far more pleasant. Yeah. Great, thank you for listening in and joining us. If we have any questions, we're, we're happy to take them. I'll stop sharing the screen now. Anyone with any questions, they can drop in or raise a hand. I see a raised hand, so I'm allowing. Yeah, Pratisha, you can go ahead. Yeah, uh, this is quite interesting. Yeah, and I'm just curious to know, like, since uh, the chats and high and low points, this uh, it's it's like you could do it. But when when are you looking forward to extend it to other forms of uh, images also? Like, I've seen people struggling with uh, interpreting maps and all. So, do you have any plans? to take, uh, take this ad in other, interpreting other forms of images? Uh, data visualizations are slightly different from images in the way that they're, uh, when we have the access to, to the source of the data, or, or in this case, which is the X and Y arrays that we can play around with and, and display in, in a different way and in different modes, it's a little more straightforward. There are applications uh, on maps and especially other forms of data visualizations, for example, a pie chart or, or another kind of chart that are way easier to do than, uh, um, than an actual image, in which case you'd have to extract qualities or um, uh, attributes from the image to be able to convey that um, more meaningfully. That can be done and is, is being done with machine learning at various companies that are extracting information like who are the people in a certain image um, and, and things like that. Same thing I'm imagining can be done with maps. As far as this project is concerned, it's very focused on data visualizations at the moment, but that's a really interesting idea. Yeah, thank you. I hope uh, you progress. It's very pretty interesting to listen to you. Thank you. We have a question in the chat that, is it possible to have a hands-on workshop about this? <laughs> uh, yes, it depends on what, what would the hands-on workshop entail. Uh, whoever asked this question, would you want to unmute and want to elaborate on this? For the person who asked, if you would like to try it yourself, you could download the latest Yahoo Finance Android app and either enable TalkBack on your device or go to the settings page and enable audio charts. And you should be able to see a button on the, on the stock detail page under the chart to open the audio chart page. So if you actually wanna see it live in production and, and try it out, it's possible now. 
um, let yeah, me paste the enough. link. Let me paste the link to the uh, Play Store, and also the uh, open source project where you can actually see the code that Yathan wrote, uh, uh, and see exactly how it's implemented. Yeah, yeah. If you have questions, feel free to open an issue on the open source repository, and we'll, we'll try to answer it. By we, I mean Yathan. <laughs> Great. Anyone else with any questions? You can go ahead. We still have time. Uh, yeah. So there's one question from YouTube. Uh, Krishna asks, how can this help cognitive users like people with dys dyslexia and colorblind deficiency? So how does it help them, this particular use case? So someone with colorblindness should, um, if there's enough contrast on the actual um, chart, should be able to use regular charts to begin with. But if not, we've taken care to have um, enough of, of both focus contrast and the actual um, line chart labels, buttons, everything on the accessible chart experience to make it even more accessible uh, with respect to contrast there. Uh, with respect to cognitive disabilities, the more modalities or the more ways we have of interacting with a certain data or information, um, the more options we provide users to, to absorb that data and to interpret it. So in that way, it's indirectly more accessible to people with cognitive disabilities. That wasn't the initial intent of, of this particular feature. It was very focused on low vision and, and blind users, but it does have applications uh, for other forms of disability. Which, is, which you'll see is a common theme among any accessible feature. It tends to have a lot of overlap. Great, I think that answers it. Uh, anyone else, any question? We still have time, we can take. Absolutely. Well, I think this is one of the features that, uh, I mean, Playing an audio chart, I think that's a very interesting question somebody asked about the cognitive disability because I see since they can't remember so many things as the users already showed that in the <clears throat> in their uh, in the study itself. So there's right. a way that even many users would prefer I, I um, you know something read out to them, right? Right. So I think that way cognitive users can anyway uh, see and if they can't still remember, they can anytime go and, you know, make the talk back read out and, you know, understand and they may not every time remember, but at least uh, at least some cognitive users and even people with learning disabilities use a screen reader. And and that's that's a good thing to know about. I mean, they only see this, see the chart there. There's no distraction for them in this view, if I'm right. not wrong. No, there isn't. Yeah. So in that case, they have enough time and there is no distraction for them to, uh, for them so that they can at least try to understand or make sense of the chart. I guess that's, that would be the way forward is my understanding. Right. And, and the, the good part about this is they don't have to listen to every single data point. Uh, a lot of people with cognitive disabilities are able to interpret music a lot better than they're able to interpret spoken or written word. So once they do hit a data point they're interested in or, or, or something that they would like to explore further, that's when the spoken feedback takes over. Otherwise, it's the tones um, that are um, uh, the main experience. Yeah, thank you so much. It was such a wonderful presentation, a uh, very unique use case, and I think Everyone in the audience has had a really great time listening to both of you. Thank you, Tanisha, and thank you uh, to the Hello A11Y team. Thank you for having us. Thank you all so much. Right. So I think we are a little bit ahead of the schedule and we don't have the next speaker so uh, yet uh, so the next talk is scheduled for 8 30. Uh, 
till then we can just catch up if anyone has uh, anything they want to share their experience with how they started with the accessibility journey or anything that they want to share with the audience you can raise your hands and i can allow you to talk and we could have just a great time Satish Manjula, you have anything to share? Uh, can I go ahead? Yeah, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yeah, so good evening all. I am Prajisha. So uh, currently I am uh, under a fellowship where we are trying to prototype. We are working on a product which is for the uh, kids with cortical visual impairment. So we are developing a web applications where, uh, where the visual therapy could come on the, the online platform. So as a part of this, I was getting... Uh, you know, uh, custom uh, uh, trying to understand how, like, how's the even digital accessibility for the blind and low vision people. So that's how I it brought me here. And like, I got very curious about how they navigate the things and how it's uh, how's their day to day life. Oh, that's wonderful. Any insights that you want to share? Any challenges that you faced or any things that you learned that would help? Uh, oh, it's just okay it, because it's just in my mind I am sharing it over so yesterday I had attended a webinar by ILO and one thing which I have noticed is every speaker is uh, trying to uh, when they are addressing the audience they are describing uh, what they are wearing and uh, they are from which origin and what what their surroundings look like. So it just strike like it was a curious uh, observation for me because usually we don't think about that when we are trying to address, uh, we keep saying like trying uh, inclusivity and all, but when we are addressing or when we are trying to, uh, you know, try to implement something in our day-to-day -day life, we often tend to forget that. Uh, so. Yeah, these are small, small, small things. It's kind of it made me very curious. Like I'm learn, I'm yet learning, and it's uh, these observations are kind of making me more curious about this whole thing. Yeah, I mean it's definitely great, and especially when you're in a community and you hear a lot of people. Firstly, you get motivated to work on a lot of things, and secondly, you get ideas how to head start your journey. So uh, that's great, Pratisha. Thank you so much for sharing it. Yeah, yeah, thank you. 
anyone else if you want to come up and share any of your projects any of your learning or anything in general related to accessibility okay then i think i guess we'll take a break for the next 10 15 15 minutes and we'll be back at uh, 8:25 and that's when we have our next session scheduled by Shilpi Kapoor she'll be speaking on digital accessibility and building for scale so uh, stay tuned uh, have have uh, some snacks by your side or something and we'll be back after the break thank you so much
Hello. Okay, so I guess uh, everyone had like a good coffee break. Uh, so our next speaker uh, for the day would be Todd Libby, and uh, he would be uh, speaking on start your LI journey and how how to become a accessibility advocate. So over to you, Todd. Hello, hello, Tanisha. Is Todd already on the panelist? Yeah, he is. I've added him. Hi, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, yes. Yeah, so uh, I already introduced yourself, so the stage is all yours. Okay. Let me share my screen here. First, let me... Here. All right. And can you all see that? Yes. Okay. So hello everyone. I'm Todd Libby. Um, first, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the organizers uh, for putting this together and allowing me to present uh, this talk today. Um, the speakers for their presentations uh, and um, all the attendees for attending. Um, I want to, uh, again, thank everybody and uh, happy uh, GAD Day. So let's go into this. Um, let me All right. So first off, uh, I am 100% an accessibility advocate. It's part of my job. It's been part of my job for 22 years now. And um, from the moment that I started my accessibility journey, it's been one that has been uh, educational. And now I get to educate people uh, during my job as well. There are still many barriers for entry, accessible entry. And it, this uh, picture shows a wall and it has a sign on it, which says accessible entry. And the uh, handicap uh, or the disabled symbol uh, on, the, on the sign as well. Um, I find many things still that are inaccessible uh, during my job and doing auditing during the day, uh, get to uh, find these things and uh, for the companies that I work, uh, do uh, yeah, work for, um, I get to point these out and uh, assist them in implementing changes for the, for the better, for inclusive design as well. So 1 billion people is the figure that I have. Uh, with the advent of new technologies and the rapid advancements of platforms and frameworks and libraries, 15% of the world's audience 
has a disability of some form. And this number is from the link on the bottom from the uh, World Health Organization, which um, I don't know if I can share that right now, but I, I can share that uh, later as well during the uh, Q&A. Um, and of course, we all know uh, uh, cognitive disabilities uh, can be one form of disability. So in this picture, I have a, a man uh, with his uh, son or family member who appears to have a cognitive disability. I don't want to speculate on what that could be, um, but they are uh, touching foreheads and having a, a nice family moment together. There's also visual. Uh, disabilities. And in this next slide, uh, it shows someone who is standing in a, what appears to be an alleyway holding up a pair of eyeglasses and everything is pretty blurry in the picture. Uh, and I know of many people, including family members who have visual uh, disabilities as well. Motor skill disability. And in this slide, there is a individual in a uh, wheelchair and next to that individual is uh, an able-bodied uh, individual standing next to them. And they appear to be in, at some sort of sporting event maybe, uh, or some event and they're uh, not close to where people, other people are um, where there's a fence because of the barrier of, it appears there's a lawn or some sort of uh, grassy area uh, that they can't uh, access with the wheelchair. Now there are also disabilities that aren't seen. Situational and invisible. Um, situational being uh, just take for instance, um, a broken arm uh, or a child sitting in your lap. Uh, those can be situational. Invisible uh, disabilities can be uh, migraine headaches. I suffer from migraine headaches myself. Um, and when I do, I can't focus well, sometimes things get blurry. So there's a lot of contrast uh, problems, issues that I have uh, when, if I have to work uh, through a migraine headache. So here you see in this frame, uh, in this slide, a father holding his child, which brings me back to that uh, when you have a child, that's a situational disability. Uh, I've had, I have two children and uh, they're much older now, but when they were younger, I had uh, a situational disability as far as a child in my arms that was kicking around. They wanted to get down. They wanted to do whatever. They wanted to go off and play. And uh, I was trying to do work, answer emails, or so, so you know, so on and so forth. Uh, so that's a situational one that uh, I have encountered. So there are strides underway to address more newer and hidden disabilities with the advent of the first working public draft of the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 3.0 release. Um, so I wanted to share some tips to start uh, your accessibility journey or to bring accessibility to the workplace uh, and advocate for the people who, I borrow this from a friend, uh, for the people on the other side of the glass or the people that don't have a voice. And, um, we as accessibility advocates can speak on behalf of those people and advocate 
for accessibility in the, the projects and the workflows that we do. So the first one, as you see here, uh, buy-in. Uh, it shows a man straightening his tie. Uh, his uh, picture is cut off at the chin. But uh, buy-in and support starting from the top of the organization will continuously be successful across the organization. Keeping executives engaged and meeting with them regular, regularly will ensure success with your accessibility initiative, but will also uh, provide support for when new accessibility initiatives need to be implemented or when there are disagreements among teams on the implementation or prior prioritization, you have the support of executives. Once you have buy-in from executives, and that, you know, it, it goes back to uh, coordinating efforts across departments may be difficult and time consuming at first. So that support from the top will help alleviate the pressure and the burnout that can happen when taking on the task of creating or and implementing an accessibility strategy. If the pushback is more than you can handle, you can, uh, uh, which I have done uh, on occasion, uh, I've said something like, well, you can save the company a lot of money and time and headaches that will be saved in the development and the design phases to get a better product out to everyone. And you won't be losing potential revenue. So once you have that buy, as I said, uh, from those executives, having a person or ideally a team focused on accessibility throughout each department can help. They can help answer questions and you can uh, work with others and you can help others in those departments uh, practice those guidelines. Become the expert in that department regarding accessibility and or become the expert in your department when it comes to accessibility. Help set up documentation and tooling helps uh, and serve as an intermediary between departments and their accessibility, accessibility liaison if there is one. Assess the products and the expertise within the company. So gauging the point where the product or products are as far as how inclusive and accessible they are is a key priority. That will only help the team or individual in their efforts to make the product better. Uh, what, what's the current state of accessibility as far as the product goes? What's the current state of accessibility with the website or the mobile app? Uh, getting the general idea of the level of knowledge uh, that the teams and the people in the company currently have is also important going forward. Um, how versed are they in the accessibility guidance and, and practices? Do they know anything about the uh, web content accessibility guidelines? How much training will you need to have? And I will say, I will add this, uh, the web content accessibility guidelines are difficult to read. From the standpoint of, I get a lot of questions from people on Twitter and through email about, what a certain success criteria does. And I, it's, it's very technical. And uh, as far as the 3.0 uh, guidelines that are being worked on, um, hopefully that technical jargon and that uh, technical uh, wording will become easier for, for people to understand. Establish guidelines for the company is the next uh, thing I wanted to uh, stress. Consistent product implementation greatly benefit the organization. It reduces the amount of work, which in turn can reduce the number, or it reduce the amount of stress teams can be under. Design systems should not be used to only, you know, ensure branding and consistency, but accessibility also. Uh, accessible design systems make a world of difference.
accessible components can help for obvious reasons and reduces the time it will take to start over from scratch and try to invent something that has already been done. Testing procedures should be implemented to help departments such as QA and help developers do their jobs well and efficiently. This is the important one, I think, as well, is getting uh, colleagues to buy in and care. Uh, more buy-in from uh, the people that you would work with and see every day during the day. In this landscape, again, of frameworks and libraries, uh, going fast and breaking things and overlooking and undervaluing accessibility, some people need to be educated and those that do not have voices, like I said, the people on the other side of the glass need you to be their voice. Pitching to those not already in the know that accessibility means less time, less headaches, less stress, and can sway a developer I have found faster than anything else. It's also important that we share so in my case, it would be the American Disabilities Act in the United States, uh, in Canada, the Accessible Canada Act, or uh, in the EU, it's the EN301549. But share the importance of your country's accessibility standards if there are uh, standards. Um, the US government, for instance, uses Section 508, and that may differ, that obviously does differ, uh, from country to country. Sharing the importance of these guidelines that your country hopefully has can be crucial to getting the company and departments on board. So in this slide, it shows uh, the different laws for different companies. So you have the USA has the American Disabilities Act, also known as the ADA, Canada, the Accessible Canada Act, the ACT, and in the EU, it's EN301549. Uh, when WCAG 2 is released, it will be considered for inclusion in the EU standard. England has the Equality Act of 2010 combined with several equal access acts and regulations, including the Disability Discrimination Act, of 1995 called the DDA, the BSI 8878 standard. And to find out more, there is a link right there. I will have a link to the slides that I keep online uh, so that um, you can have these links handy as well. Lived experiences. Take examples from the outside world every day as use cases. Test and tape or video cases where a disabled user is trying to use an inaccessible website or application, a form, for instance, or a piece of assistive technology they use in everyday life. It's easy to find such cases if you know someone in your family or your circle of friends. Maybe you'll need to go to a source that tests with disabled folks outside of the company. Uh, for, there's a company, for instance, that I know of, or there's actually a few uh, that uh, do accessibility testing with disabled folks. Uh, one is called Applause. Um, and showing these cases to colleagues can turn some people around to embracing accessibility at the workplace and in the workflow. And in this picture, uh, I have a sign with the uh, men's and women's restroom, handicap accessible uh, restroom, disabled, uh, excuse me, uh, restroom, uh, changing station for uh, children, and an arrow pointing to um, a train platform. We've evolved since I can remember where there were no signs uh, for these things other than the men's and women's restroom. Uh, accessibility 
does not end after handoff. So websites and applications are an ever evolving medium that we work with, even designs and testing. Uh, so we need to be cognizant of those changes and make it paramount that accessibility be practiced well after handoff to the, for the client to the client or upon completion of the project or in everyday workplace situations as well. Uh, which brings me to the next point of employing uh, disabled folks. Uh, these are the people with the lived experiences. They can benefit your company and team by having them aboard. Uh, you can use folks to test with that have those lived experiences, and you can also hire folks that have those lived experiences. If you don't run a company, then you need to look back and get executives on board as I was making the uh, first point with getting executives on board with bringing on one or two folks to help test uh, at the company. Uh, and they can help with the accessibility uh, of the website. They benefit you as much as you been, uh, are helping them and benefiting. Understanding the guidelines. Yes, it can be very daunting to look at the WCAG, w, uh, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, and read it. It's very uh, daunting to look at. Uh, so it, it's writing that will make even the most seasoned accessibility head uh, explode. Accessibility experts head explode. Excuse me. Even mine. I've read it uh, recently and I, I, there are places still in the WCAG guidelines that even confuse me. Uh, those who have been working in the W3C have heard the people that want to be able to read WCAG guidelines and understand those guidelines. So as I said before, 3.0 makes a conscious effort to make that possible with more clearer language. Uh, for now, I do suggest to people that they read through and make an effort to understand something in the meantime that they need that will benefit them going forward. Ask all the questions. Uh, I tell this to people all the time, whether it's on Twitter or your Slack groups or Discord servers, email, whatever form of communication you're using. Um, ask questions, ask them all. No question uh, that you have shouldn't be asked. Um, I can be found in online, I'm on Twitter a lot and uh, through email or whatnot, I'm on the Ally Slack uh, channel as well. And um, you can find me and ask me the questions. And if I don't know, I can find somebody who does know or a source for you that will answer those questions. Um, and the accessibility community is very gracious and happy to help. Uh, it's made of all, up of a lot of uh, people. It's made up of a diverse group of folks that are more than happy to share their experiences and their knowledge with you. Uh, it's not a closed group of people. And um, we love to answer all the questions. Thank you so much, Todd, for this wonderful session. Um, we do have a few questions for you. Uh, okay. Would like to answer. So the first being, uh, what was your motivation behind advocating web accessibility? How did you get started with it? Well, I have family members, like I mentioned, that um, have uh, accessibility needs that have uh, disabilities, um, motor skill uh, disabilities and um, visual disabilities as well. So when I uh, would see these people, friends even, and family members, uh, struggling with something that got me to want to learn more about accessibility because I heard about accessibility um, through my contacts 
at the time online. And uh, that was basically how everything started. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's great. When you see people around you, you te- and you tend to understand them. That's a great insight. I hope it motivates a lot others to go in the same direction. Uh, the next one, uh, like, uh, how would you encourage people, especially teams or organizations, to start considering web accessibility as an important aspect for product and especially for websites? <clears throat> so the key uh, for me has been when I do, um, when I talk to companies or businesses, um, the key is getting the stakeholders and the executives on board, the person or people at the top. Um, like I had mentioned in the talk, when you get those people at the top on board, that makes your job of advocating easier. And they will have, hopefully, they will have your back and you will have their 100% support. Um, I don't know if that answered the question or not, but that's the major step. Yeah, I think it's great. I think for every initiative, it's the first step that counts. You need to take that first step forward and things to things will fall into place. One last question for you, uh, and then we'll wrap up your session. Uh, as an advocate, do you see designers having some additional knowledge around web? Rec- accessibility because nowadays designers are more obsessed with the design looking aesthetically pleasing but they don't consider web accessibility as something that they should lay stress on so on the designer front what's your take i see a small uh, increase in designers um wanting to get wanting to learn about accessibility more uh there's a long way to go the same uh i i see the same with developers as well um out of the two groups i think designers are a little more uh, they they don't know or they don't, they haven't learned about accessibility like developers do. Um, Because when I talk to a developer and say, well, this uh, doesn't meet uh, WCAG AA standards, uh, they usually, if accessibility um, is something that they're focusing on, that usually gets fixed fast. Um, as far as designers go, I've had more uh, conversations about uh, color contrast with designers and who weren't aware that they were color contrast guidelines. So um, steadily more and more as I talk to more and more designers in the communities that I belong to, I get the word out and that's where a part of my advocating comes in. Yeah, I think that answers the question. Thank you so much for such a wonderful session. I hope this really motivates a lot of people to start taking up accessibility uh, very seriously while their development process, their designing process, and their overall product development process. So thank you so much. It was wonderful having you here. Thank you. I Thank appreciate you. it. Thank, Thank you. you, Todd. Yeah. Thank uh, you. Please reach out to Todd if you if you want to get into, uh, you know, advocacy, especially around web accessibility. Reach out to him on Twitter. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Todd. Thank you. Okay. So uh, unfortunately, we had to like there was some personal commitment for our next speaker Shilpi so it was uh, on priority so we uh, so she she couldn't make it for today's talk Uh, but uh, we will see her in uh, one of the our coming meetups 
so don't be sad you'll you'll get to hear her talk uh so this would this was actually the last talk of the day but you know before we wrap up uh, i have to thank uh, so many people so to start with uh, i would like to thank all the speakers that made it possible today and made possible uh, you know shared your knowledge with everyone uh, i would like to thank all the organizers uh, satish tanisha aditya especially ragwa uh i mean it it wouldn't have been possible without all of them next i would like to thank zainab and the whole hasgeek team who helped us basically with all the technical setup and you know today uh, you see it on the youtube live and with with all the technical stuff that we have today so thank you uh, hasgeek and zainab for that and yeah thank you all thank you all the attendees uh, who who came today i i hope you had uh, some knowledge and we will keep, we'll keep doing it every year definitely and like stay tuned on our uh, hello 11y page you can visit the website and you know we often do meetups as well so a big thank you to all uh, and if i missed anyone please uh, sorry but uh, yeah that's all uh, tanisha do you want to add something no i mean that's it it was a wonderful day so again happy global accessibility awareness day to all of you thank you all for joining in it wouldn't have been possible without your support and uh, yeah stay tuned in and we look forward to having more events on a more regular basis so that we can bring forth more accessibility knowledge away Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. Good night. Thank you.